good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the Strategic Dialogue on uh, European Universities, which is an event hosted and organized by the Institut Francais in the Netherlands, the Studio Europa Maastricht, the Youth Alliance and Maastricht University. We're very glad that you find your way here. Um, well, we couldn't have picked a better day looking at the weather, right? To sit inside all day <laughs> and discuss things, pondering about things. It's basically the morning after the Europe Day. And yesterday, a lot of people celebrated European cooperation, but I'm very glad that we managed to gather people to ga today that actually work on Europe every day, right? I think for many of you, it's a daily job to work on European cooperation. So you do not only celebrate it, but you also put your visions into action. I'm very glad that you could all come to Maastricht to do this with us. Uh, my name is Job Zomerplaag. I work as a program editor at Studio Europa Maastricht, and I also am pursuing a PhD at Maastricht University and you and you merit. Uh, the European Universities Initiative, I think for many of you, it's something that you basically hear every day about. <laughs> but for those that are maybe not too familiar with it, I'll briefly introduce to you what it's about. So in 2017, it was introduced, eh, and it was about fostering student mobility, research collaboration, but also working towards excellence, and that we as a European continent, European Union, should also work towards some sort of strategic uh, mission and vision in, in uh, regarding higher education. 44 alliances have been formed ever since, involving 340 higher education institutions in 31 countries. So that's a lot. It's a European project that stretches way beyond the borders of Maastricht, the Netherlands. And uh, we're very glad that many of you could come here today representing those institutions. Today we take stock of the achievements of the past five, six years, but also the challenges that you have been facing in your work. And we hope that together we'll actually form together a backpack full of things to take home with you to your home institutions so you can work on this and elaborate on this. Um, well, many of the first generation uni European universities are rolling out, eh? they're wrapping up, but will also continue in the future. But there's also a couple of uh, you that are here in the room that are part of universities that are about to join one or that will be part of the next phase. And we hope that we can also transfer knowledge and experiences from the previous phases to the next one. Um, questions to guide the conversation for today, uh, a few, right? I think everyone comes in here with questions, but some guiding questions that we have formulated today. What is needed to further cooperation that's already there? But also, how can universities fulfill European ambitions while remaining embedded in their region? So on the one hand, we have a European ideal, European vision, things that we want to work on, but there's also regional embeddedness, and how can we work towards this? Before lunch, we'll share best practices and common challenges with each other in smaller interactive groups. We'll explain in a bit how that's gonna work. You'll be talking about purpose, governance, funding, but also the implementation of joint programs. And then after lunch, uh, we'll actually have a lineup of very inspiring speakers and experts who will talk about how, to, how universities can contribute to the sustainable development of their region, but also how we can better collaborate in research. And a last panel on how the European Commission and national ministries can support universities with future steps to take. There will also be a networking event at the end of the day, so we hope you all join us there as well. Um, I would actually like to get a bit of a sense who is in the room today. <laughs> um, who of you has traveled more than six hours to get here? Wow. Pers uh, person in the back, where, where are you traveling from? Poland. Okay, very nice. And you? France. Okay. I <laughs> already met with a person from Torun. Very welcome here. And, and there in the back? Uh, from France as well, very glad to have you here. Who has traveled less than 15 minutes this morning? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that's, I'm very glad to hear that as well, that you made your way here. Um, I'm actually thinking whether I have a clicker. Is this my clicker that I can use? Okay, there you go. Uh, I think this is my, there you go. There you go. Um, who works, of, uh, who of you works in research on the topic of, oh, there you go. So we have some researchers in the room. Very welcome. Who of you works at a university on policy? So on hi higher education policy? Okay. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's a very, well, yeah, very diverse audience. And who works at a government on the topic of higher education or maybe on research or innovation? I think many of the people that will actually work on this will join in the afternoon as well. So maybe I should raise the question again then. And also one last question I wanted to ask how did you travel to here? Because if we were going to talk about sustainable development and about achieving things in this regard, who of you traveled by train? 
Wow, okay, that's great. <laughs> Who of you traveled by plane? Ooh, okay. <laughs> Who came by bike? <laughs> ah, okay, there you go. <laughs> well, we're very glad to have you all here. Um, for whom is it the first time in Maastricht? Last question to ask. Okay, these are the people that over lunch you should maybe approach and tell them where to go to next, right? After the conference or next time they visit Maastricht. But we're very happy to have you here for the first time in Maastricht. It's a wonderful city and we hope you also get to enjoy it a bit outside of this conference hall. Um, I would like to introduce the first speaker for today, and that's uh, Professor Rihanna Letchert. Professor Rihanna Letchert is the president of Maastricht University since last year, no, uh, no, since November 2021. And before she was rector of Magnificus. Yeah, <laughs> 21, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, previously you were, uh, you, you were the rector of Magnificus, Magnificus of this university for five and a half years, but you're also chairing the Youth Alliance, which is one of the European universities initiatives well, one of the very first ones to be set up, which is coordinated by Maastricht University. So, Professor Rihanna Letcher, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Job, for this nice introduction. I had to think, is it already two years now? <laughs> Time flies, dear colleagues. Good to see everyone. And uh, I see actually many familiar faces. That means that the European University Alliances is really becoming a family. And not only you have familiar faces, but also people from the European Commission, from the government indeed. So it's good to see that you're all here today to discuss this very, very ambitious initiative, I would say. And maybe also good to share that for, I think immediately when I became president of Maastricht University, I automatically became the chair of the UFA Alliance. That was no choice. Just uh, you come into a position and suddenly you're chair of I don't know how many networks and uh, initiatives. But I have to say that UFA is, I'm not sure if there are other people in this group, uh, it's one of my most favorite to be able to chair with all the dilemmas that it has. And I think you will also discuss that today. Uh, it's not easy to work together with so many universities and non-academic partners in so many different countries, different cultures in these institutions. And then to have this very ambitious vision of building a European university that is a challenge in itself, but it's a challenge, I must say, that for me um, gives a lot of energy. And I think that's what you need in any job, eh? that it gives you energy. But I was asked today to give a more of a formal opening to all of you, so I will stick to my role. And first of all, welcome you all here to this wonderful new uh, conference uh, location, the MEC. It's not situated in the best part maybe of Maastricht. We're working on that already for years, I must say, to re-innovate the surroundings here, but uh, we're getting there. Huh? Step by step, also this part of the city will, uh, will become a beautiful, uh, beautiful place. And I know that the ambassador of uh, France to the Netherlands, uh, Francois Alabun, is at the moment not here. He will be here after you have your lunch to welcome you, but also on my behalf, also for the colleagues from the embassy that are here this morning, uh, I really would also like to express my gratitude that he will be here today. It's also uh, partly also the initiative of the Institute Francaise, but also the embassy itself, that we have this conference here today. So I want to thank also the team of the Institute Francais for co-organizing the event and to work with us on further developing this very important topic for the, I would say, entire higher education sector. And um, in particular also, of course, welcome to all of you who came to travel to Maastricht for this event. I just got my first cookies from Poland. You know, the good thing of working in these international environments, that's, there's always someone that brings special treatments from their countries. So in case you never did that, it's a habit, actually, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much. Now, in February of this year, I had the opportunity to go to Rijeka in uh, Croatia with our entire UFA community, where we had our town hall meeting. That's how we call it. And I must say that was also really, again, a highlight in the whole UFA experience, not because it was in the beautiful part of Croatia. Rijeka is definitely, I would say, a tourist destination as well, if you are still looking for your holiday destination. But it was also the first meeting uh, attended by the university, uh, the university Sorbonne Nouvelle, who is a new member 
in our alliance. And I can also now take this opportunity to also formally announce that the Sorbonne Nouvelle is a formal partner in the Youth Alliance. And with that, I also really have to express my gratitude to the French Ministry and also the European Commission for their formal support in helping us getting through the process of accepting a new partner in our alliance. And we're very happy to have uh, the Sorbonne Nouvelle as part of our uh, Youth family. And we visited last year Paris to also before we accept it, also to see uh, if we share the same values, uh, because that's for us very important. If we accept a new partner, then that new partner should also fit within the, uh, yeah, the aims and ambitions that the Alliance have set, but also the way of working. And for us, as you know, UFA is a student-centered led Alliance. And I see one of our students, and later I will maybe call you here to the stage. And I know you are, able to do that, because I'm putting you on the spot, Lea. Uh, Lea is one of our students in the Youth Alliance, in the Student Forum, an excellent student that is also fighting for the ideals that we have within the Youth Alliance. Now back to the Sorbonne. What we did in the Sorbonne is also discuss with the students and the staff and the government, so that's also the executive layer, to see if they also truly believe in active student involvement and not just at the end of a process and then tick the box while you, you agree. No, really co-creating together the ideals that we have. And def definitely also with the Sorbonne Nouvelle, we tasted during that vis visit that they share these values. So we're happy that they are part of our UFA family. And um, I think it's also maybe important to uh, share with you why it is so important to invest so heavily in the European University Initiative. And we, uh, yesterday was the birthday uh, of uh, the Schumann Declaration, uh, which is very much about uh, fighting for peace and unity in the European Union. And we often take that for granted. And I think if you look at the world today, we know we can never take that for granted. And also at uh, the 4th of May in the Netherlands, we commemorated the victims of the Second World War. And every time again, you are remembered that living in freedom and having your education in freedom is not something uh, uh, that we can ever probably take for granted. Uh, currently, I'm in the middle of developing a program for female students from Afghanistan uh, to be able to come and study in the Netherlands because they are now prohibited to study in their own country. So there are many examples why it is important to keep fighting for, first of all, our freedom, but also for freedom in education. And Lea, can I ask you to come here? Would you? And I, and, and I didn't discuss this with her, but Lea and myself are for the last few nights together in uh, Zooms. Um, I will not say why. <laughs> and top secret. Top secret. And um, we were uh, getting an answer, our question during those, uh, one of those evenings, why for uh, Lea it is important to contribute to the European University Initiative. And she had such a brilliant answer. And I know you can repeat it here. Huh? You're sure. okay? Yeah, I'm Okay, here. good. <laughs> this was really not prepared, so. <laughs> so thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I will make up to you. I believe you. <laughs> um, yes, so it is a very um, odd experience to be a student within all of this staff members and rectors and presidents and you know of the universities but I think that's what makes UFA Alliance very special that students are really the co-creators so we get a seat uh, at the governance levels and we are in these conversations for everything for building the alliance for how we should move forward and I think that is something not a lot of students get to do and I definitely think that without that, UFA could not be a front runner or could not have a chance at being the front runner because the students are what gives the energy. They are the generations that are going to continue studying and building mm -hmm. the European values. So their voice needs to be in there. And for me to combine my views um, as a student with the experience of the staff members who know how this uh, tanker that moves slowly, which is the university system, works. 
she already knows that. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that is really, really nice um, because we could not do it alone. But I feel that the staff members could also not do it alone because sometimes they get too caught up in their own environments. So they also need our third perspective. Very critical one, I must say. <laughs> but I think it's very necessary. So for me to be able to co-create that, to be in that position, to see our um, students realize that they also have a space there because they often felt in the beginning that things are imposed on them, but now the students are taking an active role and they, they're saying, we need this, we really want this to be uh, the future direction. And they're really fighting for that space. So they're actually taking the driver seat role, which is the final goal of the UFA student journey and the bachelor degree that students are in the driver's seat. So just being in the co-creation process is already starting that whole um, domino effect. And I really, really, I'm proud to see that within UFA, so that's what inspires me. <laughs> yeah, that's also one of the great things of this. Huh? You meet so many brilliant, engaged students uh, that help us develop this whole uh, ambition. Thank you so much, Lea. So, um, let me also um, get back to my official speech. <laughs> Um, as not everyone might be familiar with UFA, but I doubt to think that that's the case here, uh, otherwise you would maybe not be here, let me just briefly look back, because I think that is also important, because we have achieved quite a lot between 2019 and 2022. So currently the UFA Alliance uh, includes 10 academic partners and two non-academic organizations that in the pilot phase have been building the first steps in this European university model, which allow our students, as you've just heard, to benefit from academic training at all these different institutions, while also supporting them to develop as professionals and also as citizens. And in this way, UFA allows students to build really this European curriculum while they continue to also study in their home country. And during COVID, of course, that was even yeah, that it was uh, a blessing in disguise that because of the whole online um, way of working and teaching at that time, we could also have a very speedy uh, process within the whole development of, of UFA, I must say, even how bad that period has been. Now, the UFA um, programs have attracted over 860 students between 22 and November 22, so 2020, 22. And what you should know is that the students are asked to actively create their own personalized learning paths. Eh? So that is the idea. Eh? So it's not this is the curriculum, you do it. No, you yourself develop your personalized learning path. And they engage in courses and activities across Europe and are also enabled to engage with local communities. And as such, for instance, students have successfully participated in the entrepreneurial activities that we have set up, like the Youthathon. We have great people that have a uh, creative mind to develop all these nice titles. Youthering, Youthathon, so Youth is like this brand thing. Eh? The Youth Challenges, of course, but also the civic engagement activities. The Youth Help Desks or other volunteering activities. So we really would like to see the Youth, both staff and students, work very closely with the local communities in the cities in which we are rooted. Because that is for us not something just we do that because it's asked from us by society. No, we really believe that that can also help bring both our students to a next level, but also our staff and our institutions. Now, next to the whole focus on education and civic engagement, we've also led solid foundations to support and foster talented doctoral and postdoctoral researchers. And that's maybe nice to mention, that's more of a side effect maybe, because once you start with developing the UFA uh, European University Initiative, the partners of course get to know each other really well. Eh? We meet a lot at, at Cyprus meetings, Rivieka meetings, online, and because you get that real relationship with each other, it's also quite 
easy and logical to then also develop uh, proposals together in the whole research era. And what we've seen is that we have been really successful in obtaining uh, research grants with the Yufa family. And that's, I think, how you also in the end will build like a genuine university in which univer research and education is very closely interlinked. That's why we are a university. And I think we should not forget that, that this is not only about developing curricula, uh, co-teaching, uh, innovating our pedagogical vision on education, which we do with the, with the 10 and our non-academic partners. But it's also about allowing the staff to meet and set up initiatives in the research domain. I think that's really important as, a, yeah, as an additional consequence of, these, of this European University initiative. Now, um, it also is hard work, I have to say. And I see many colleagues here from my own university here that on a daily basis uh, work to develop all the different program lines in I don't know how many work packages and across 10 universities. And I will tell you, I once set up an educational program with six faculties in one institution. And you don't see my gray hairs, but I do have them after that initiative. And that's in one institution already. Yeah? Uh, uh, Lea said it really very sharply that the university is sometimes like a tanker, very hard to move. I see everyone nodding, so we all know that who works in the university, let alone with 10 universities in 10 different countries with different schedules, different ideas about education. Yesterday in our evening meeting, one of our colleagues said, we have all of different holidays, so we can never really schedule because then that country has a holiday and then that country, even the practicality sometimes pose so many challenges to, uh, to move forward. But we do it, and for the coming years, we aim at upscaling the impact of our joint work. So ideally, more and more students and staff and citizens can access the opportunities and uh, uh, all of the uh, activities that we are developing with and for that. But in order to do that, we do still need continuous support from our government and from the European Commission. I have to be honest also there because it is really an additional effort that we put on our institutions, on our staff, on our students, the ones that are so dedicated to invest the extra time. So the enabling financial and legal uh, support is not just a random thing. We really need it. We really are still in need of a proper financial and legal framework to further develop the, uh, uh, the, the, the initiative. So I'm pleased that the French and the Dutch Ministry of Education, as well as the European Commission, are present here today to address some of these issues. And I'm sure that also during your interactive sessions this morning, you will be able to more in detail explain what you then actually need for the future in order to become a sustainable initiative. Because I would find it a real waste if I would look back after five years and I would not be able to find you for anymore. Then we really have uh, put a lot of uh, useless energy in, in this initiative. So it has to become sustainable. And that's for all alliances, I would say. So with that, um, I, I really take also this opportunity and it's written in bold, so I will express it more fiercely, is to call on member states, the European Commission and our local governments to work in close synergy with one another to support the European universities and all higher education institutions to be able to fully seize the opportunities that transnational cooperation brings to education, to research, to innovation and to society. Again, that should be absolutely linked. Now, Studio Europe Maastricht and the UFA team have worked hard to set up a program this morning for you in which you are really stimulated to exchange all of your ideas, to overcome the challenges that you face, which will also then be uh, received uh, by the uh, local governments, the national governments present in your workshops in order to fully implement um, the European Universities Initiative. And I also would like to pay tribute to the great work of the European University Association, because in their policy brief, very nice that you're here as well, uh, the European Universities Initiative and System Level Reforms, Current Challenges and Considerations for the Future, in this policy paper, you can find it online, 
you uh, you have identified the four topics that you will also discuss in the morning. And for those of you who haven't seen the policy paper, I really recommend you to, to read it. It's very sharp. Now, um, lastly, um, I'm also happy that our program includes a session on the regional engagement of universities. And as Maastricht University, we always say we are the European University of the Netherlands. You have to claim something. Eh? <laughs> uh, but I really believe that we have a right to claim it. But also, of course, with an international outlook and firmly embedded in the region. We cannot work without having very close ties to the region. And now it's easy for me to say, and then I go, and we don't, I don't, we don't show how we do it. No, we actually show it. And ho how do we show it? We work together with the province of Limburg and four cities in Limburg, from Maastricht to Venlo, Sittard, Heerle. For those of you, of course, you know Limburg by heart. Uh, there are four cities, uh, Venlo, 80 kilometers from here, so it's not really a neighbor city. Um, with these four cities and the local ecosystem around these cities, and I, and I mean then also the big enterprises, but also the small enterprises, we build campus uh, ecosystems, where in triple helix way of working, we all invest in research and innovation and education at these locations. So in Venlo, it's about food, nutrition, logistics. In Heerle, it's about data science. At Gemmelot, it's about chemical sciences, bio-based materials, everything relating to the sustainability. And here in Maastricht, it's the health campus. And that is really for us uh, really important to show that we aim to further develop this province, that we not only invest in Maastricht and in students that stay here, no, we also want to invest in the other cities in Limburg where uh, local enterprises and big multinationals can co-create together with our students and staff what they also need to further develop their own companies and their own uh, regional uh, footprint. And I'm very glad that also later today, Astrid Boeje, who is uh, the CEO of one of those campuses, will present to you how we do that. So how we really make that triple helix cooperation an equal partnership with a lot of profit, not only economically, but definitely also societal. Now, and finally, and then I stop, because otherwise Job will kick me off the stage here. I also would like to acknowledge the Studio Europe Maastricht for hosting this meeting. Now, we launched uh, Studio Europe Maastricht in 2018, again with the province of Limburg and the city of Maastricht, because as the city where the treaty was signed, we definitely have also the legitimacy to claim that we are a European city. And for that reason, we set up Studio Europe in order to be able to also uh, co-create again with citizens here in the region, in the EU region, their views on how the future of the European Union should be developed from all perspectives. So not as everything is pro-EU, no, also with a critical view on what citizens actually perceive on the next steps for the European Union to develop in governance-wise, but also thematic with regard to the missions. And Studio Europe is doing an excellent job there to, in a, with a low threshold, uh, organize events and activities with our local communities on the future development of the EU. And they have a very creative team with Gonny Willems as the director and with a lot of creative people around her. And you've seen Job already, Anneline, they're all here in the audience. Uh, so I'm very proud of all of you for um, making this day possible together with the UFA team for a long time led by Daniela Trani, sitting behind Gonny. We have female leadership in this organization that is very impressive. Um, and together with all of your teams, you make this day uh, happen again. So thank you all. And for the audience, I wish you a wonderful morning where you can share your ideas. I just learned you had your Limburg fly. You can never have a meeting in Limburg without the Limburg cake. There will probably be more over lunch. You, they will be thrown with cake uh, every time you have a, a meeting in Limburg. But to be serious now, I wish you all a very good day and I will hear back at the end of the day from uh, Goni and from Daniela uh, the lessons also that we can take on when we meet our representatives in Brussels and The Hague. So good luck and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm looking at my colleague whether we can start now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. 
Um, for many of you, welcome back. For some of you, welcome to this uh, strategic dialogue on European universities. We have had a full morning full of inspiration, creative brainstorming, exchanging information and experiences that we have had uh, throughout the past five, six years in the different European university initiatives. Um, for the afternoon, we have a, an exciting program as well for you, uh, which is also about, as I told you before the lunch, about uh, inspiring each other, uh, hearing about best practices, also learning about things that are happening as we speak, but also discussing things that maybe still need to happen or need to be improved in the, in the near future. Um, this event is organized by the Institut Francais in the Netherlands, Studio Europa Maastricht, the Youth Alliance and Maastricht University. My name is Job Zomerplaag, I'm a program editor at Studio Europa Maastricht and I'll guide you today through the program. Uh, I have had a very, very nice morning with all of you and I hope we can continue the same way for the hours to come. If you have any questions throughout, also feel free to raise your, uh, raise your hand. I really hope that we can continue the nice interactions we have had throughout the morning, and I think that is all we can bring today. Um, so the European Universities Initiative, very briefly for the people that just joined, was established in 2017 to foster partnerships in student mobility, in research and, and also in excellence between universities and higher education institutions. 44 alliances have been established ever since, involving 340 higher education institutions in uh, 31 countries, and some of them are represented here today. Uh, we learned this morning that people came from far, right? From France, Poland, uh, other places. People came near <laughs> from Maastricht, uh, surrounding areas. Some people came on foot here by bike. And we're really glad to have this diversity here in the room. Um, questions to guide the conversation for this afternoon are what is needed to further cooperation, but also how can universities fulfill European ambitions on the one hand, while also remaining embedded in their own regions. And I think it might sound like a paradox or something that's in contradiction with each other, but we're gonna show this afternoon that it doesn't have to be, yeah? And I hope you can all bring your own experiences from back home where you also show that European ambitions on the one hand doesn't have to contradict or yeah, fight basically battle with, with your local ambitions. Um, before lunch, we shared best practices and common challenges in small interactive groups. We're also going to refer back to them later in the program to also make sure that the speakers that we have this afternoon have a bit of an idea of what was has been discussed and collected during uh, the morning uh, sessions. Um, and now I, I want to make you all aware that we have a, a full program this afternoon. As I mentioned earlier, I think I'm not sure everyone heard that, but there won't be any coffee breaks, but that doesn't mean that you can take a break at some point for yourself, grab some coffee and water that's still available at the area where you just found it. But also if you want to visit the restroom and stuff, it's all fine, but please do so in a considerate way, right? <laughs> so we can just continue the program as it goes. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Francois Alebrun to the stage. Mr. Francois Alebrun is the French ambassador to the Kingdom of the Netherlands since September last year. Welcome. I also just heard that it's the first time for you to visit Maastricht and hopefully not the last, of course. We're very happy to have you here and hope to see your return. Previously, uh, you served in several diplomatic positions in Brussels, New York, Quebec, Vienna and Paris at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France. Mr. Uh, Alebrun, the stage is yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon, um, dear Dean of the Law Faculty, Mr. Smith, dear Director of Studio Europa Maastricht, Mrs. Willems, dear representatives of the ministries of uh, Netherlands and, uh, and France, uh, dear representatives of the European Universities uh, Alliances, Ladies and uh, gentlemen, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure for, for me to be in Maastricht today with you uh, to discuss the important topic of uh, European universities during the first strategic dialogue between the eight alliances in which French and Dutch universities uh, take part. You may remember that um, uh, in 2017, the French president, uh, <laughs> President Macron, uh, 
made a proposal uh, to, for uh, a European university initiative and pleaded for the creation of what was considered as a very ambitious goal, uh, at least 24 alliances by uh, 2024. Alliances that would foster the European academic integration, most notably by focusing on mobility and the standardization of academic calendars and degrees. And six years later, we can see that this initiative has exceeded expectations. By the end of 2022, 44 European universities had been established, involving 340 higher education institutions from 31 countries. Over 1,300 associate partners from NGOs, business, cities, and local authorities then contribute to all those projects. And instead of 24 alliances, the European education area aims to have 60 by the end of next year. 60, which would uh, represent uh, 500 universities across Europe and 10 million students. This success and this ambition illustrate uh, both the political interest of this uh, project and above all the willingness, the commitment of the coordinators, the students, researchers from academia to join and build European relations, improve mobility and overcome the different systems that vary from one member state to another. And of course, I would like to uh, express my deep gratitude to those who render possible this process, in particular, the, the participants and coordinators in the Alliance. And at the same time, and that the reasons why uh, you are present today, and we are present today, we must remain aware of the aspect that can be improved. Today's main question uh, should be, uh, where do the alliances find themselves now? What has been achieved? How do the alliances of tomorrow uh, would look and should look like? Regular meetings are in this regard useful. And I would like to uh, recall that last year, on 30th June of June 2022, in France, in Versailles, France hosted the campus of the European universities, a strategic dialogue for all, at the time, 41 alliances, in conclusion of the French presidency of the European Council. The timing of that event on the very last day of the presidency, of the French presidency, underlined how much value the French government attaches to the initiative. And the same goes for today. We listened uh, with interest to the valuable input of the participants in uh, this morning's workshops. Your input coming from those who work every day to improve higher education and science on a European scale is essential for policy makers. During uh, this afternoon program, we will therefore, of course, uh, pursue discussions uh, on your findings, on good practices, areas for improvement with the French and Dutch ministries and the European Commission. Without your input, the policy makers would not be able to develop this framework. France's strong uh, commitment and implication was uh, illustrated during uh, 
the recent state visit that President Macron uh, uh, paid to uh, the Netherlands last month. And it's very interesting uh, to uh, note that a very important event in this state visit, and President Macron uh, himself considered the heart of this state visit, was a visit to the uh, University uh, of Amsterdam, to the Department of uh, uh, Physics, and another very important uh, aspect was also the conclusion of many agreements between research institutes, uh, which show uh, that for the Dutch uh, government and for the French uh, government, uh, this aspect of cooperation on science is essential for the future of our countries, of our two countries, but for the future of Europe, because it's clear that the bilateral cooperation that was fostered during, in particular, this visit was really uh, designed to foster the European uh, uh, sovereignty, the European resilience, and the European capacity to build our future. So we are proud that France and the Netherlands are uh, the countries investing uh, the most in this initiative and a, a commitment was, that was uh, restated by a declaration that was adopted by the two governments uh, in April. I would like to conclude to really thank again Studio Europa Maastricht, the UFA Alliance and the University of Maastricht for their organization and for the excellent way we are welcome here. And thanks again to all members of the alliances and other participants for being present. And I sincerely, sincerely hope that today will inspire you in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Salabun, for your welcoming words, introductory remarks for this afternoon session. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we now move on to an inspirational panel, uh, which sounds very promising, doesn't it? Right? Um, as we all know, community engagement and societal impact are crucial to the idea of the European Universities Initiative, also as expressed by the ambassador. And universities are expected more and more to contribute to the sustainable development, <laughs> sustainable economic, economic development of their regions in which they are located. But how can we practice what we preach and turn these visions into actions? And that's what we're going to talk about. How can we learn from existing efforts? Uh, well, we have a great lineup of speakers uh, for you to discuss these questions with. But we actually asked them to first introduce themselves to you and also the organizations that they work for, the work that they have been doing in this regard. Afterwards, we have a chat. And as I said, I hope that the best questions will come from you and not from me. Yeah, <laughs> that's, the, that's what I hope. After each of the presentations, um, so there will be about 10 minutes presentations. And after each of the presentations, I hope you can turn to the people sitting next to you, maybe on your right hand side and briefly discuss for like a minute or so what you took away from that presentation and write it down. I think it would be nice at the end of all presentations to hear what you remembered, what you uh, what, what, what stuck with you. Uh, so uh, that's something that I would like to invite you with. And it also gives our speakers the time <laughs> to also transition to their speaker, uh, to their slides, you know? <laughs> so that's also very nice about this. Um, now, and now I would like to invite the first uh, speaker, but let me first introduce you. That's Annalena Kleis Kulik. It's a familiar face, and also because you were one of the facilitators this morning. Annalena is a Deputy Director for Policy Coordination and Foresight at the European Universities Association. You represent more than 800 institutions of higher education in 48 countries. Um, and you work on cross-cutting topics like the European Universities Initiative. And prior to joining the organization you currently work for, you worked at the European Commission's Directorate General for Education and Culture. Annalena, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, this is for the slide. Uh, yes. <laughs> ah, is it on? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me also this afternoon in the panel. I got also myself a lot of inspiration from this morning. So now you announced us as an inspirational panel, I will do my very best. <laughs> Uh, with that and just share a little bit um, of EOA's reflections on the big topic of universities and societal impact. Um, 
because we had recently our annual conference where we had more than 300 representatives of our member universities in Gdansk in Poland coming together on exactly that topic uh, because we said we have to talk about impact. And why do we think this is such an important topic? Well, you were all in one way or the other either working in universities, in alliances, or with universities or policymakers on this. So that might be a very familiar topic uh, for you. I think in recent years uh, there has been a bigger focus on impact again because we live in times of accelerated change, big societal challenges. Uh, the first time I came across uh, this focus in policy discussions on universities and the impact they are making was actually with the financial crisis in 2008 and the years afterwards, where there was a big discussion pressure on university funding and uh, our members really had this feeling, uh, the need of really having to show what they contribute to society, how they can justify that they are there, what are they doing. This was the first time. And now I think um, with the multiple crisis we are currently experiencing over the, the last years, this topic is coming back in a bit of another fashion. We're talking more about contributing to um, addressing societal challenges, contributing to sustainable development, one of the topics we'll also uh, address later, regional development, uh, contributing to um, making society fit for the digital transition, uh, these are all topics uh, that are also important for universities and it has uh, something to do with the university's accountability to society. We at UA like to talk a lot about academic freedom, institutional autonomy, which we think is a prerequisite for universities to do in democratic societies what they are actually there to do, to do all the great research, innovation, education, and contribute to culture. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about the outcomes and the results and that we also need to find ways, creative ways sometimes, we used that this morning as well, creative ways uh, how to show what this impact is because it's often difficult to measure. At least I would say it's difficult to show this in numbers or numbers can only tell us part of the story. So it plays a role in a lot of discussions in university rankings. We often criticize they are much far, far too much focused on uh, yeah, citation research output and don't consider enough what universities actually do in learning and teaching. Uh, the whole discussion going on uh, on the research assessment reform um, with the coalition on this is moving a little bit away from uh, just focusing on quantitative indicators to measure impact, but still impact is an important uh, thing to look at uh, also when we talk about research assessment. Then it's important also in, in the policy debates and last but not least in the discussions about the future of the European Universities Initiative. Uh, all you have worked for the last years on um, how your alliance can create impact, can actually make progress in all these goals that have been set out. Um, so again, it's now also a little bit the time where policymakers and the European Commission also ask, well, what did you achieve? You know, what is your impact? But what are we actually talking about? Impact. Every one of you, if I would ask you in the room, probably has a bit of a different idea what we understand by this. And I'm not here to define that concept for you, and I won't go through all these things, but this is just um, like a short way to where I try to capture all the aspects that we've been discussing with our members in relation to this topic. We have developed, um, actually it was through, throughout the pandemic, in a six-month consultation, we have developed Universities Without Walls, UA's vision for universities in 2030, and their um, societal impact was a very big topic. But rather than saying uh, what is often called the third mission of universities, so how universities engage with society, uh, we actually, with our members, agreed to look at this from a different perspective and say universities contribute to society through all their missions, through all their activities and research, learning, um, education, and culture. It's not something separate that you add on and you do a bit of civic engagement, but it's actually something that is also very much part and a transversal part of the activities. So it can be 
the things you can count, the number of graduates, of course, that's how universities create an impact. Um, it uh, can be the number of, um, yeah, great innovative ideas that come out of research projects, the contribution to developing new technologies, but it can also be more intangible things. Academics go a lot out and speak as experts. We saw this during the pandemic. They contribute their academic expertise to evidence-based policy making. That's a very important outcome. Maybe a little bit more difficult to capture this in figures. And I don't want to go through all of this, but of course an important um, contribution as well, especially from the European University Alliances, is this contribution to mutual understanding between the people um, in our countries to actually create what we could call a European identity, but also critically re reflect on what that actually means and how this relates maybe to other identities we are all having and also to a more international um, open view of our societies. But what do we know? I said it's difficult to count sometimes. What do we know um, from EOA's work um, with its members? We do a lot of comprehensive or um, comparative studies as well. Um, and one of these uh, has been conducted by my colleagues in the Re Research and Innovation Department recently. They looked into universities' contribution to innovation, and innovation is often um, associated a lot with, you know, the impact you can make, how you can, um, how universities can uh, contribute to um, addressing societal challenges. And there, um, we've asked our members how they think what is very important uh, for them uh, in their contribu contribution to um, a sustainable transition. And what you can see here is that most of the more than 165 that answered said developing new technologies through university research is actually something that we consider very important. But the second thing is already as well um, improving student and staff understanding of sustainability. We here see again the different missions, research on the one hand with a very concrete outcome and then something which is more um, about changing mindsets. Um, here again, what comes up as important, uh, what universities would need to improve to actually make maybe even a better con contribution um, to the sustainable transition is um, how they translate their research results into concrete um, uh, yeah into concrete innovations and that is something where our members think they're already doing uh, a lot but they could do maybe a bit more um, and then we asked them as well um, how they measure success uh, their success what are they let's say their KPI, KPIs uh, in uh, in their work on the sustainable um, transition and there what comes up very high on the list is actually partnerships, uh, partnerships with also actors in the local innovation ecosystems, but also with up other partners beyond. And I think that's very relevant for our discussion here today, of course, also with the university alliances and how you can maybe um, connect your local innovation ecosystems of each of your partner universities to one another and also to partners beyond that. Um, Universities also try, our members also try to embed um, uh, social engagement, civic engagement in their learning and teaching, in their education programs. And you can here see um, in this survey, we've asked them about different ways how they do this. So some have um, actually integrated this as an explicit part of uh, their study programs or also in other, um, in other universities, uh, students can get credentials for social engagement. So that's another, let's say, very concrete way of how universities try to foster this as well among especially the students. So this was the evidence we have, let's say, from UA's work, which is of course always very broad looking at the sector as a whole. Um, but I would like to come back to my statement from the beginning. Societal impact is a very broad concept. Um, there is a lot of focus, especially in policy dis discussions, that we have to measure this with quantifiable indicators. And that is very valuable. But I would say we shouldn't forget the important part of things that are more difficult to count. And that's why I've... I've taken one of the great researchers you all know who said exactly that. Not everything that counts can be counted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> because <laughs> that's a very w nice message, and I think that also will extend the scope maybe of the discussion we'll have afterwards. But this is a very important uh, thing to mention. So thank you for bringing the message from Gdansk to Maastricht. And uh, then I take it to Tampere. I actually would like to invite you now in the meantime to briefly chat with the person sitting next to you, what you remember. And then in the meantime, we can set up the presentation of uh, Nisso Yuzo Kai. Yeah? All right. <laughs> Right. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> I will briefly introduce you and then you can have the words, yeah? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think your presentation is put up now. Perfect. And if you want to go back, it's this one. Yes. <laughs> so let's, uh, it's your first time in Maastricht. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you're originally from Japan? China, okay. A friend living in Tampere. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, in ten minutes, you can continue your chat. That's the good news. Um, <laughs> we are ready, and I hope you are too. Um, we're very, very happy to have one of the leading experts in higher education policy and uh, Triple Helix collaborations with us, Mr. Doctor, even Dr. Yuzu Okai, who is a senior lecturer and adjunct professor at Tampere University in Finland, originally from China. He has coined the term of a sustainable entrepreneurial university, which might sound like a new term, but in 10 minutes time you can tell everyone about it because uh, that's exactly what Mr. Kai is going to exp uh, explain to us. He has written extensively about the role of universities in regional innovation systems and today he is our speaker. The floor is yours. <laughs> oh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I'm also very honored to have an opportunity uh, to be here to share with uh, some of the academics' perspective on university's uh, societal engagement. So, but before I uh, start speaking, so I, I want to thank you again for inviting me here. It's really my pleasure. Uh, so, as we are talking about university's uh, third mission, societal engagement, so for many years, many decades, however, the meaning of the term has changed because the world is facing new challenges, environmental challenges, climate change, also the social equality issues, uh, resource you know, depletion. So all these require us to be more sustainable. Uh, we need to have innovation, but sustainable innovation. So university need to have new kinds of roles in engagement. So my talk today is uh, a little bit uh, uh, conceptual because I'm going to talk about what we need to redefine some of our conceptions, so how we can re-examine the same term we are using. So basically it's about the conceptual changes in the transition uh, of uh, universities' uh, societal engagement. Okay, it works. Uh, so how to understand, I use the term uh, sustainable uh, innovation or sustainable development and innovation. So what is changing in the society? So we used to call uh, the innovation uh, system to describe the changes in the knowledge-based economy, but now we have the term called the innovation ecosystem. Even though it's only add eco, but there's a lot of you know, changes. So basically, the, uh, what's new in the innovation ecosystem is our ec ecological perspective. That means you know, everybody, every sector is more uh, connected to each other. So this is why we have the discussions about the uh, universities islands. You know, we talk a lot uh, about, you know, how we can close our collaboration with the many partners. And we also need to have the co-development, co-creation, 
I think we are somehow not not in not you know unfamiliar with the term ecosystem. I just want to highlight you know the three uh, changes. For example, we are from the regional engagement to the global engagement. So it's not simply local. We also need to think globally, but also we we'll act uh, locally. Uh, secondly, we need to also move our focus from. Uh, uh, purely for technology advancement, but for sustainable innovation, but also social uh, innovation. So uh, finally, we need to also change our economic focus to more holistic perspective, emphasizing economic, social, and environmental development. So our society is changing, and also this has some new requirements for universities to identify the uh, key collaborators or stakeholders. So I'm, uh, so I'm also working very much uh, on the uh, uh, triple helix model. So I'm, I'm also uh, now the, the editor in chief of Triple Helix Journal. So which this is uh, also a, a very important community for studying the triple helix collaboration. But now we also see, you know, there are also uh, some. Uh, other helix models called the quadruple helix models, adding civil society there. So why not stop here? So we also can add, you know, environment, you know. So, uh, so there's a lot of discussions in the innovation studies. But I want to emphasize that uh, actually triple helix model uh, does not exclude civil society. Actually, triple helix, according to the originators like uh, Henry S. Gowitz and Lut Lestoff, they consider civil society is too important to be treated as a parallel helix, but it's a foundation for triple helix. So without a civil society, you cannot develop the, uh, uh, the dynamic of the triple helix model. Uh, so recently, I tried to integrate, uh, in one of my articles, I tried to integrate all kind of he uh, the helix models, quadruple and the quintuple helix models. Uh, I propose a new concept called a new tri triple helix model. So basically in this model, there's two kind of synergies that's related to the innovation ecosystem. We still need a triple helix, university, industrial, and the government, which generate the innovation dynamics. But uh, together with innovation, uh, I mean the triple helix, I call it the innovation genes because that's basically the dynamic for innovation, but we also have the triple helix relations with the society and the environment that build the sustainable development dynamics. So in innovation ecosystem, both dynamics are equally important. I do not want to, you know, uh, go into detail, but if you are interested, you know, you can check, you know, my article. So I try to illustrate how the innovation uh, uh, dynamics and also sustainable dynamics works. But this is something uh, uh, very uh, theoretical. But I want to uh, also come back to the university. So along with all the changes, so what tr transformations taking place within higher education or in the universities? Uh, so this is another concept. We are talking about entrepreneurial universities in university societal engagement. Uh, but in one of my article, I propose to add, you know, sustainable entrepreneurial universities. Uh, so basically, uh, this is a, a, a concept try to highlight the sustainable development dimensions because entrepreneurial university to a large extent emphasize the economic roles and the treating universities more like a corporate, but by adding the sustainable uh, on the top of the uh, entrepreneurial university is uh, uh, basically stress the transition from sustainable to, from entrepreneurial to sustainable entrepreneurial university. So basically the idea is try to integrate the uh, social, uh, economic, environmental dimensions for sustainable development into the traditional university's three missions, education, teaching, and uh, uh, third mission, or the societal engagement. Uh, so how, uh, so what are the societal engagement uh, missions are changing? So uh, basically I try to emphasize the three shifts in the societal engagement. So first is from technology transfer to knowledge exchange. 
So technology to transfer is one way. So university produce knowledge, then we transfer to the industry. Uh, by saying knowledge uh, exchange is emphasized the co-creation process. So when university collaborate with stakeholders, we are learning from each other. So the second shift is from uh, building the reciprocal uh, collaborations with the partners, especially industries, for building, building trust. Actually, universities has a very important role in building trust between different actors. So this is becoming increasingly important for developing the sustainable world. So this should be emphasized. So finally, uh, universities should not simply meet the requirement of the society. Like, you know, we, we, we educate a student for industry need. We produce the knowledge for certain sectors. But universities should, you know, be more critical about our society and also to shape the future society. So this is also very important dimension. And when universities performing these roles in the transition I have just highlighted, it's all very important to uh, go beyond the single university's engagement to university partnership. For example, how the European Islands or international university collaborations can better engage the society. For example, we use the term global engagement. Uh, for example, when you are having different partnership, you can discover some hidden opportunities. Otherwise, you cannot see. And then you can build the weak ties. So this is uh, something very important term in the sociology. So weak ties sometimes is more important than, than strong ties in achieving the better result and also building trust. So universities can help you even to uh, build the trust among the industry partners. And finally, uh, you can come up with new models. So going beyond the traditional model like we discussed in the in, in our session in, in, in because sometimes you know we see a lot of challenges because we have been following the traditional model. But if you come up with new models for collaboration for developing society, then the existing challenges will become not a problem. Um, so what should we uh, focusing on in this kind of thing? So I think I try to finalize uh, because this is a, some, uh, some will point from a recent published book uh, by some of my colleagues, which I, I also know. Uh, so basically, they develop a framework uh, focusing on the everyday activities of a university. I think this is a very important, even though it sounds you know, not innovative, but this is very important work to focus on what we are doing on everyday activities, not those fancy ones, you know, eye-catching ones, but how we can in integrate our societal engagement missions in our teaching in our you know, research, everyday research, how to engage academics, that is very important. And uh, I do not want to go beyond, you know, I just want to say, you know, for example, employability, this is also something I'm interested in. You know, this is also one example how we can educate our students better, you know, support and shaping the society through integrating teaching research uh, together. Um, this is something I'm not going to say. Uh, but it's, it's a it's a one uh, of my recent work. Uh, I try to promote a concept. You know, we should be changing our understandings about the skill fit because normally we talk about skill match. You know, that's a problem for employment because we do not have the skill from a university and the requirement from the employers. But actually, we should focus on the signal fit. So it's not only about uh, what, what competencies, you know, uh, there is a match, but also about how, you know, universities consider important, then how we can transfer the signal to the, to the industry and how the industry can well receive the signal from the university. I, I want to finish my talk here and thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You can have a seat and we'll see you back later. Yeah, just take a, a minute or two to, to reflect a bit on the talk. I think it was very nice how they align, right? I think also the first thing, and you were talking about, Annalena, about quantifiability and that we shouldn't focus too much, but on a broader mi mission, and it felt like you continued that stream. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the third. Uh, I think we can maybe set it up, and in the meantime, you can have a yeah, short chat.
<laughs> about the quality of the lunch. <laughs> ja, ze uh, gaan hier. Ja. Ja, zo, nou, het triple helix hoef je niet meer uit te leggen. Dus nee, het is wel goed gelukt, hè? <laughs> all right, all right, let's continue. Um, because I have a next speaker for you, um, who, is, uh, who is Dr. Astrid uh, Bouye, um, which is very nice because uh, Dr. Yusuf Okai already addressed this idea of everyday activities of universities in the field of sustainable entrepreneurial activities. And we have a very nice example of that with us, and actually from an example that's very near. You're currently the CEO of the Brightland Smart Services Campus in Heerle, which is a triple helix innovation campus. Before going on stage, you said, well, maybe I should briefly explain what a triple helix is, but in a way that was already <laughs> perfectly introduced, so thank yeah. you very much uh, yeah. for that. You were formerly a board member uh, of the Statistics Netherlands, yeah. where you oversaw data services, research, and innovation. And be previously, you also hel held various director positions at Maastricht University, and you have a PhD in chemistry. Nice news is that actually you will join a new innovation campus very soon, yes. which is the campus in Sittard Geleen, which is maybe 20, minu uh, 20 minutes car ride from here. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, the called the Brightlands Camelot Campus, which is a, uh, yeah, a triple helix campus in Limburg that focuses on chemistry, circular materials, and biomedical innovation. So congrats on that new position. But I believe this presentation is about your current position, but I, I guess there's a lot of interconnections Absolutely. there, right? Yeah, okay. also something more about the other campuses <laughs> as well. <laughs> Looking yeah. forward, thank you. So thank you so much for having me here today with this uh, example from practice uh, in how universities can make impact, real societal and economic impact. And because in my view, and I was glad to hear that's also supported from a scientific perspective, uh, these two aspects uh, go and also should go uh, hand in hand. Uh, this slide says triple helix innovation, but the, uh, the upcoming slides will show that we also are already venturing in the field of uh, quadruple helix innovation. And I'm also uh, was very interested in learning about the term of uh, neo triple helix innovation, which captures, I think, very well what we are uh, doing. Uh, we as Brightlands campuses, and I say we, and I'll get back to that on the next on the, uh, slide, we have all been founded by Maastricht University and the province of Limburg. And the first campuses were founded around 11 years ago. And the aim was uh, to do something to make impact into Limburg and also Dutch society. And for this, you have to know that uh, the Limburg economy has in the uh, historic past been firmly rooted into mining, coal mining, and that these mines have been closed. And that's uh, already almost 50 years ago, but the impact uh, on employability, health, and social status of the people that are living here is still present here to this day. Uh, Maastricht University and the province of Limburg uh, decided to start uh, working on di uh, diversifying the economy and also helping in uh, shaping the large transitions, which at that point in time, it was already becoming clear that there were challenges in the field of sustainability, in the field of digitization, in the field of health, uh, speci specifically also in this region. Uh, and here you already see uh, in, a, in a very uh, uh, seed-like manner uh, that uh, economic uh, and societal transition can go hand in hand. So these campuses were founded Starting, starting with the Camelot uh, campus in uh, Siddharth Geleen. Later on, three other campuses were founded, 
all by the province of Limburg and Maastricht University, together with a fir uh, third party. In the case of the Brightlands campus uh, in Heerlen, the Brightland Smart Services campuses of, uh, campus of which I am CEO, this was uh, APG, which is a very large uh, uh, Dutch pension fund. Uh, it's one of the largest in the world, actually. Uh, and later on, we also added a fourth partner, which is the Open University. All the other campuses have a large company as their third sh shareholder. And this ensured that the triple helix innovation is already embedded in the uh, structure of the campus and in the government uh, of the governance of the campus from the start. Well, goals were creating employment, attracting and retaining talent, uh, fostering innovation and driving Limburg economy forward. And as I told you, we now have four Brightlands campuses uh, with uh, different themes. So the Brightlands campus in Venlo focuses on healthy food. Uh, Camelot focuses on sustainable materials, on sustainable chemistry and biomaterials. Heerlen focuses on data science and art artificial intelligence. And Maastricht focuses on health. And we all collaborate, which is a strength. We are, so to speak, a ecosystem of ecosystems. Uh, and here, this on this slide, you can see the impact that this development has had uh, uh, on the region up to this day. Uh, and each square represents one of our campuses. And the upper number is the number of com companies that is present at the campus. The middle one is the number of employees. And the bottom one is the number of students that is active at that particular ca campus. And what you can see is that the numbers uh, add up. And so does uh, the impact. And that's important because, uh, as I already t told you, the mining history has made it necessary to take measures in diversifying the economy and counteract the impact of closing the mines, which, which happened quite quickly in the 70s, in order to have uh, alternatives. And I think that we have succeeded in making this disadvantage an advantage for the future. Well, I said already, uh, Brightlands adds up uh, because of the combination of the campuses and the themes that we address. Uh, which are in the heart of the global transitions, but also because we have succeeded in partnering with uh, societal partners, with uh, market par partners, with, no with knowledge partners, and uh, that we succeed in having scientists and entrepreneurs and students collaborate together at very beautiful also locations. Uh, and that has led to quite significant expertise from the uh, uh, in-practice side of things, in how you develop ecosystems, because these ecosystems do not just magic into uh, being, they are created, they are built, and it costs blood, sweat, and tears, and a long time. It takes two decades to build a sustainable campus uh, uh, to build them. And that expertise is here uh, in Limburg, is present uh, um, by the bucket load. We also, of course, given the geogra uh, geography of this region, are very active in cross-border collaboration. And we as a campus, for example, uh, collaborate with the Corda campus in Hasselt and the Digi campus in Aachen. But we also collaborate, collaborate in multiple interreg projects and also other uh, European projects so as, so, such as the digital innovation uh, hubs. Uh, and that, of course, uh, from that perspective, we also uh, make a valuable contribution to the Dutch and uh, uh, to the society and economy, economy on the Dutch level. Well, to give you a short impression, uh, as a campus, we focus on data science and a AI, but the subject is everywhere, so you have to make choices on where you apply the data science and AI. And we work in the fields of public services, health and care, circular industry, and fi uh, fintech, and of course these uh, topics haven't been chosen by accident. There is a link with uh, what the other campuses do. And uh, below the bonnet, so to speak, of our uh, data science and AI car, there's a lot of technical expertise. Uh, but the technology, of course, changes over time and is, uh, inc the, the uh, speed of change is increasing. So uh, instead of uh, taking uh, the technology as the core of our focus, we take the application as the core of our focus. But in everything that we do, we take human-centric AI as an important approach so that we take the ethics of uh, the application of AI as a central focus because if you apply AI in the wrong way, and I think everyone here can think of the examples, then you get a non, uh, the, the effects and outcomes that you don't want. 
Uh, well, I said uh, ecosystems don't magic into being. You have to work on that. Uh, and that's done by campus teams. And the campus teams, they work on making the connections with the companies, with the knowledge institutions, with the government. And they have knowledge on the developments in the field that the campus is active in, so that they can signal if something is becoming interesting and start projects on that. So that is what we do as uh, campus teams. We organize consortia so that we can very swiftly uh, react if a grant uh, opportunity, for example, comes into being. Uh, we can organize access to funding for companies, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Well, these ecosystems consist of three things. Content, you have to have something that you work on, of course, that is attractive to companies and to knowledge institutions. Facilities are buildings uh, in, at other campuses, also the lab facilities, clean rooms, greenhouses, etc. And of course, the ecosystem. So the number and the quality of the companies and the other uh, organizations that are present at the uh, campus is, of course, of real importance. Well, here a quick view of our ecosystem. Uh, and we have uh, at this point in time, we have uh, uh, around 50 companies and organizations present at our campus and we work with around 100 companies and organizations. And there are really large names that we uh, work with currently. Uh, of course, we are lucky to be active in the field of data science and a AI because this field is booming and we gain a lot of interest from partners that want to collaborate uh, with us. Here you get a quick view of our facilities. It's important to also have an attractive location that people want to come to, especially in this time where vir virtual working is also on the up and up, uh, because uh, campuses exist by collaboration and by people meeting and getting together and getting inspiration for new ideas. Uh, well, I'll skip this slide, but please keep in mind that we try to have uh, something in place for each and every kind of organization that we have present at our campus so that it's attractive for them to come here. Uh, innovation programs, incubators, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Good also to know uh, is that uh, we have uh, thus uh, uh, succeeded in becoming on uh, one of the Dutch uh, officially recognized uh, uh, AI hubs. And also here you see coming into existence a ecosystem of ecosystems with national collaboration. Well, coming to the end of this presentation, um, if you look at the role of the university, of Maastricht University in this ca case, it has been not only uh, important, it has been crucial. They are, have been a founding father of all these campuses. They are a shareholder. They bring in the knowledge uh, into the projects and they also bring the students and the study programs and also the, the inspiration and the IP for startups. But they also get a lot back from these campuses. So they have a place where they can put their academic knowledge into uh, practice workplaces and study places for the students, for the internships, etc. access to the issues that companies are facing in real life and networking uh, and the faci facilitated start from consortia. So uh, I'm skipping this example, but what I want you to uh, keep in mind is it's a lot of work creating a campus, uh, but it's very much worth it uh, in embarking on such an adventure. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, please take a moment to discuss what you have heard and then the speakers can come up to the stage and then we can have a brief discussion. Yeah, so please. This way. Um, Marlies, can you maybe do this? Uh, I, I'm not seeing any of my colleagues now in the room. But so meteen als we vragen uit de zaal krijgen, dan dank je. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, there we are. Um, I just want to point out that we have a very nice diversity in the panel as well. If you think about it, someone who is working in practice 
on the, on the topics we have discussed, someone working in the policy field and also in monitoring, and then someone from research. So we're really glad that we can have these three perspectives coming together uh, today. Uh, yeah, you have all given an insight on how you look at the topic of sustainability, but also societal impact of universities. We also see that it's hard to define. So let's not try to do this today, <laughs> but rather look at things that we can discuss. And maybe I, I'll kick off the discussion because I think we've been hearing a lot of different words. And for me, as a non-expert, I thought like a quintuple helix and ecosystems and all of these things. But at the end of the day, it's about collaboration, right? And I think uh, the presentation by Astrid was um, very nice because it pointed also out that you have facilities, you have an ecosystem, and then you also have content. But then, is that already enough for collaboration? Or Because I can imagine it sounds like three ingredients, but maybe there is another ingredient that we miss out on. So I was actually wondering, I hope it's fine that I actually talk to you on a first name basis because uh, I feel very familiar with you now. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so do you think there's another ingredient next to this content idea, the facilities, and, uh, and also the ecosystem? Well, sure. yeah, so first, you know, thank you uh, so much also for bringing us, you know, I feel <laughs> that we represent the triple helix, <laughs> <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Academia. Yeah, know. there you go, the triple helix. Yeah, uh, governmental yeah. agency <laughs> and the industry. Yeah. Uh, so certainly, you know, the uh, triple helix is not enough for building uh, ecosystem. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, uh, ingredients. So probably there are too many ingredients. So the challenge is, you know, how to identify the most uh, crucial ingredient. I think it's also mm -hmm. important for policy because in the innovation ecosystem, if we take the metaphor of the ecologic you know, ecosystem, because there are so many factors, small things, everything is related. But if this is the case, then it's, it's almost impossible to you know, make any theorization or make a policy. So it's very important to capture the most uh, crucial one. So at the least we can still move forward and also make mm -hmm. things still making making sense and hopefully right. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why you know from academic perspective you know this is a very important task is to see what are th as you you said you you use the term ingredient what are the very useful ingredients for yeah. example there are also debates between the triple tri mm -hmm. uh, triple helix uh, quadruple helix so basically actors these are very important uh, elements yeah. like yeah. Uh, university industry government citizens so this mm -hmm. is a very important element but, but listening to you it's important to bring focus so what happens often is policy that is there's a lot of societal goals and then yeah. it's very hard to focus yeah. so i can imagine listening to astrid's talk you see that in limburg there's specific priority areas yeah. Was that a given, Astrid? I, I don't know if you can take us a bit through how this focus was brought, because was the first a focus on which you then start looking for local actors that would fit this mission? Or did you look first at the different actors that you would have in this regional context, the ecosystem, as we learned, uh, and then, s then start a focus on this Brightland campus? Uh, I think it's more the latter. Mm -hmm. So what you see is that each campus uh, feeds into the economic ecosystem that was more or less present at a certain location. Mm -hmm. So health uh, was connected to the academic hospital in Maastricht, uh, which was the basis or the starting point mm -hmm. for the health campus in Maastricht. Uh, Camelot uh, is based on the old uh, DS uh, DSM uh, site, uh, which is a large Dutch uh, chemical uh, uh, company, etc., etc. And I think you can uh, take the term focus from the content-related uh, perspective, but you can also, if you look, look at it from a policy side, then I would say uh, ecosystems are by nature complex beings, very complex mm -hmm. creatures. But uh, uh, you can leave a part of uh, creating the ecosystem to the actors within the ecosystem. But uh, the ecosystems do need help from policymakers. And I uh, stressed in my talk uh, the importance of the campus organizations, which are more or less the oil in the machine, bringing parties together, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which leads to attracting companies, which leads to valorization of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an often overlooked point that these organizations are often hard to get funded. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, 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 but the investing in such teams is a relatively small investment with yeah. r large uh, results for a region. So uh, pol policy-wise, that's one thing. And the other thing is 
facilitating what these campuses need. So mm. if you have a national organization, which many countries do, uh, that uh, helps uh, acquisition of uh, companies, then uh, ask these uh, organizations to guide them to the specific ecosystems in the country, for example. Mm -hmm. So th that's what the policymaker side of things can do in helping uh, the ecosystems help themselves, more or less. Yeah, yeah thank you. And Alina, listening to this, uh, yeah, the both, both remarks, mm -hmm. uh, how would you relate also from your background and also learning about how universities currently, I mean, they're working on it, but they struggle. That's what I hear also in your talk. It's, it's not easy to become societally impactful. Yeah, I think what you just uh, said as well, um, leave it also a little bit to the actors in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important policy message that we also often bring into these European discussions that uh, you shouldn't try to steer too much, especially also from a European level, but you can, of course, create framework conditions. Exactly. And yeah. that is what uh, what policymakers should should uh, focus mm. about, be it at the local, national, or also European level. Uh, and that has to do from a university perspective, of course, with sustainable funding for universities. Um, and then leave it to the institutions mm. to figure it out with their partners in the local innovation ecosystem mm. of how uh, where to invest this mm. as well. And there we can still improve something with regard to the financial autonomy also of mm. universities and yeah. how they can do this. But I wanted to say something yeah. um, in relation to your contribution. You said this in your speech and also you were asking about the incre ingredients. I think one important ingredient relating also to, to what was just said before is trust. Trust among trust. the actors yeah. in the ecosystem. Yeah. And that is in a way a precondition for collaboration, but it's also something you have to give and then to start to collaborate and just do it. Mm -hmm. And that you can do in a society and environment where um, uh, yeah, you have the, the, the framework conditions to work on, um, uh, on such collaboration in a relatively free way. Mm -hmm. And you also have to accept uh, that actors in the ecosystem work with different logics. Businesses work with different logics yeah. than many academics. Definitely. So you have to also uh, yeah, trust each other, but also let the role of the other be uh, as it is. So we cannot impose academic logics necessarily mm. to businesses and yeah. not the other way around. Absolutely. So everyone has mm. their contribution. Um, and that is what we see um, most recently, I think, in the, in the, in the, in the innovation uh, work that my colleagues are doing with our members, the role of universities as uh, one colleague calls it, honest brokers in the ecosystem. So it speaks to different languages, yeah. basically, to try or to Or relates different actors yeah. to each other and also can, like with a campus, like a big infrastructure, also have the space where you can mm -hmm. actually make these actors meet. Yeah, but that's a lot on the plate of the universities, no? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you're asking a lot in that sense, I can imagine. Is this also something you find? Because there it's on the one hand, it's a very nice ideal, right? You also call it an ideal yeah. type, the Sustainable Entrepreneurial yeah. University. But if you're already like expected to contribute on the side of research, you also have to educate people. Yeah. Uh, it's still called the third mission. It's not our yeah. first mission, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, what do you find in your research that, yeah, is this, how can we priori prioritize this more and how should we see it? Should we see it as a ranking or is maybe the concept of a third mission not really fair in this regard? Well, I do not see, you know, the third mission is uh, anymore a problem because somehow third mission has been institutionalized mm -hmm. and also even on the individual level. But even though there's still some room for improvement, but I think uh, to a large extent in universities, you know, in Europe, so the third mission has somehow internalized in many okay. academics. Mm -hmm. So basically when I'm academics, when I'm uh, filling the uh, work plan, so basically it's a standard template, teaching research service. We have to distribute our time there. But uh, the problem is, as I want to emphasize, the problem is that uh, when it's come to the international dimension, basically uh, the education teach research is not aligned with uh, societal mm -hmm. development. But if we look at the regional level, so for example, you give a perfect example, uh, even in the Netherlands, you know, you have very uh, uh, closer relations between, you know, industry, university, and the government. Mm -hmm. But when we come to the international dimension, if we see universities, you know, not if we go even beyond Europe, if, uh, you know, 
Maastricht University has a collaboration, you know, with uh, some partners in America, Africa, Asia. But this normally this education collaboration just uh, remain in the student exchange, teaching yeah. exchange. Yeah. But on the other hand, we have uh, industry business collaborations, but this kind of uh, connections are still separate. Yeah. I think there's huge potential to be yeah. utilized also in terms of trust building. So the university connections, because the uh, alumni and the even professors, they have nature connections to mm -hmm. industry people. So why let uh, industry people to work hard to a, to a different culture, to build a trust mm -hmm. from scratch, not utilizing the international collaboration? Mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah. we have some potential to develop in this area. Yeah, is this something that also resonates with you or? Yeah, you and think? I yeah. think it's, also not an either or uh, question. So uh, if you look, look at our campus, we have uh, uh, scientific institutes uh, of Maastricht University mm -hmm. and also of four other uh, knowledge institutions at our campus where scientific research, teaching and making impact mm -hmm. goes hand in hand. And I think that's, uh, of course, fundamental research uh, has a very important place also uh, uh, in academia. But for uh, the uh, uh, more op uh, impact-related side, this is uh, a quite an ideal context, mm. I think. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. There's a question. I'm going to go to questions in the room. I have one thing, and maybe we can get it back into the questions that you also asked. I think what I try to identify also in this conversation is that we, on the one hand, have local ambitions, and then we have international ambitions. And you talk about globalism. We have been talking about uni European University alliances that try to do the same. But these levels are still not really connecting well, right? And I think that's also what we try to establish today. But I hope that we can also uh, go a bit in that direction. But I see a hand in the back. So I would also like to give you the opportunity to ask now some questions and maybe also comment on what you have been uh, hearing now in the panel. So uh, yeah, please stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's a mic coming towards you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for the very interesting uh, introductions um, and a change of views. Um, trust is essential for collaboration. But in the cases of confidential uh, knowledge mm. and implementation closer to the market, trust is not enough. Um, could you share with us uh, your approach? Is this a uh, question directed towards one of the panelists or a general? All three. <laughs> All three. <laughs> I would actually like to invite one of the th uh, three of you to make sure that we can cover more questions to pick up this question. So I don't know if it's uh, uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Do you like <laughs> uh, I can shortly you yeah. know, uh, respond. Yes, I you. agree, you know, trust is important. But uh, not, you know, uh, sufficient. Not cannot uh, solve all the problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, we we still have some, you know, challenges, you know, in terms of the uh, uh, research and the industry collaboration. Because uh, you know, we have the on the one hand, for example, in the in the science, we have open science. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we still in the industry have the traditional, you know, the copyright. Of course. Uh, yeah. So we still need also the regulations, I think, uh, some kind of, you know, uh, framework in addition to trust. Uh, so they mm -hmm. have to supplement or complement each mm -hmm. other. Do we have, uh, maybe for the other speakers on the panel, do you know of other clusters? Because uh, I think you very nicely highlighted, Astrid, the work that's being done in Limburg. Are there other regions in Europe that you look at and think like, well, they have figured it out. They have a good set of ingredients and they also know how to cook with it. Well, I think there are more campus sites, of course, mm -hmm. than Brightlands alone. Uh, th there isn't a specific example that springs mm -hmm. to mind as, well, th they're doing it perfectly there, but I think that there are some, that there have been some lessons learned. Uh, in, uh, in addition to open science, there's also the concept of open innovation. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we as campuses do, and many campuses do that mm -hmm. uh, up and until, for example, uh, TRL level three. Uh, in which companies work together that compete normally. Uh, and then, of course, they take the, the innovation in-house, the NDAs are signed and they develop it into a commercial product. Uh, and that's the way that you often see how it goes in practice. And what is open innovation? Open innovation is that the IP, so the intellectual property, mm -hmm of an innovation isn't claimed by uh, one of the parties mm. involved in developing the innovation, but that it's either uh, given to society or that it's shared among the consortium. Mm. 
that sounds like a lot of altruism. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> what is in their interest? Why would why would organizations do so? Well, they do it in in our uh, tech corruption program mm -hmm. uh, uh, on a structural basis, and it's because then they can share knowledge in a mm -hmm. safe play garden. Is that a word in English? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> playground, playground yeah. uh, where they normally wouldn't collaborate uh, mm -hmm. with, with parties they normally wouldn't collaborate with, mm -hmm. and they of of course they gain from the knowledge of these partners. Uh, so there is an exchange between what they give and what they gain. And specifically in the field of AI, of course, it's very difficult also to get a patent on uh, IP because you you change a zero and the, and the one in the, in the algorithm and you have a new algorithm mm. and make it too simple, but you understand what I mean. Yeah. So it's more important to be fast than to claim the IP I in see. our world. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's an interesting yeah. perspective you yeah. offer. Any uh, question there? Yeah. Actually, I, yeah, Melich, <laughs> we happen to know each other. Same yes. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Melich, Mede Özkardeş. I'm representing the uh, European Alliance uh, Enhance, so also one of the alliances. And maybe you heard about these new hubs that the European Commission is going to establish. Yeah. And our alliance is going to lead or co-lead uh, the inclusion hub. Ah. So uh, it seems. And I'm just curious what maybe uh, the experiences are about the topic of inclusion when we open up our uh, universities to stakeholders, like from the ecosystems, innovation ecosystems. Are there maybe some topics that we heard some practice examples, for example? Mm -hmm. I don't know, is it a topic at all or not? Inclusion, how to connect this with universities and innovation stakeholders, I would be very uh, curious. One thing, could you, could you briefly give a brief definition of what you understand as inclusion? Because I think yeah. it's also one of these concepts that... It's actually more about, at least in this setting, I would say, uh, I mean, we talk about impact in the society, and the mm -hmm. society is diverse. We have people, yeah. different people. We have people also facing barriers, and except yeah. especially these people facing different barriers. One I easy see. example is, of course, people with handicaps, mm -hmm. yeah. but I can, of course, continue with the list yeah. of yeah. many different types of people facing different barriers that prevent them, let's say, uh, taking part at the daily life and at different activities. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what's going to happen now with Inclusion Hub to open up European alliances, to bring them together and to meet uh, innovation stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But it is, of course, the question, what are the uh, yeah. common topics that we can maybe uh, yeah. kind of explore? I happen to know that actually in your campus you have also uh, experiments around people that are in poverty positions, yeah. right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, what we do uh, as a campus in Heerland uh, is that we have a large uh, project which is called the ELSA Lab, and it uh, stands for Ethical, Legal and Societal Aspects of Data Science and AI, which focus on focuses on uh, applying this technology in preventing uh, and combating uh, poverty and deaths. It's one of the largest projects that we do. And uh, a part of that project also is digital inclusion. So uh, you have people that are, of course, uh, uh, illiterate in a digital way, so they don't know how to use computers, for example. That's a huge problem in today, today's uh, society, and we try to overcome that in that project. Uh, so that's an example, yeah. yeah. And Elena, I don't know if this was also something that was on the table. Of course, if you talk about the society doesn't exist, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I believe that's maybe almost Thatcherism that I'm trying to say here, but um, yeah, the society doesn't exist. So was there also discussion in Gdansk and maybe broadly in your work about seeing society also as a collection of different groups of people, of different groups of interest? So yeah, We didn't discuss that topic specifically mm -hmm. this year, but I happen to have been coordinating a project on universities and diversity and inclusion a few years ago at EOA when we noticed that this is a topic that we should have some European cooperation on and find out yeah. what our members are actually doing, precisely because society is, is becoming more diverse. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, universities are still a little bit perceived as more the ivory tower. So what does yeah. it mean if we want to have, and indeed it's connected to having societal impact or working with society. And if you're interested in that, what we have also, we, we do a lot of surveys, like you saw before in, in my slides. Um, this is a little bit a few years older already, but there we have asked our members on, um, first of all, how they define inclusion, because yeah. that's not trivial to do that <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a European context. And we see that this is, of course, a, a little bit, the focus is a little bit different everywhere. 
um, but universities have this definitely also on the ra radar as a strategic topic, so including mm -hmm. diversity inclusion in university strategies and developing um, for them in their community, first of all, what does it mean and how can they open up uh, uh, towards um, other types of learners, mainly when you look at it from a student perspective. But I think that's a topic that's even you know, as broad as innovation. Probably. Yeah, and it <laughs> deserves a next conference. Yeah. So I hope to see you back in uh, Maastricht next year and we'll discuss this. We'll see. And yeah. otherwise you go to Aachen because Enhance is doing a lot of good uh, things on this in the near future. Um, I have time for our last question. And I actually was looking at you if you could help me out there. Yeah. There you go. Sure. Thank you. My name yeah. is Adam Kola from Poland. And I have a question because you've been talking about cooperation, collaboration, uh, inclusion, so trust, very good stuff. But I want to ask you about uh, competition because this is a part of academic world and, and, and business as well. And this is a kind of driver for, 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 for the future for going uh, in a better way and uh, for development. But whether this competition is against all good stuff you've mentioned or it's going hand on hand with that. Thank you. Yeah, a very big question, right? And I uh, think, but it's a very relevant one. So I don't know uh, so yeah, so if I you could that's a good that. Very good question. I think uh, uh, you, uh, you know, when we talk about the inclusion issues, I think, uh, you know, competition is a problem <coughs> if, we are if we want to have, you know, a more inclusive society and, uh, and the innovation ecosystem. <laughs> so this is something I think even in Europe, you know, have to think uh, carefully, you know, about uh, competition. Competition mm -hmm. is good, but, uh, you know, if too much competition, then we have to, you know, prioritize something where ignore some, some yeah. people even disadvantaged. Or institutions yeah. disadvantage, and isn't it all about again this framework that we've been talking about? That on the one hand allows for collaboration, but on the other hand should also account for competition, because at least how many people think of our societies that competition also brings economic efficiency, uh, productivity, yeah. etc. Right? Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I want to say e competition basically is there. We cannot completely avoid them, mm. but uh, the danger of a competition if we only compete for certain things. I think that would be, for mm. example, we only compete for ranking in universities, only mm. for the academic excellence. So that is the danger. I think uh, if we somehow broaden the scope of a competition, meaning that we are competing for different things, we mm -hmm. can even compete for our performance in inclusion. Mm. So that will be mm. more healthy. I think. Uh, this is something we really need to mm. balance in the policy level, mm. but mainly about you know people's conception, how mm. we understand yeah. competition. Yeah, how do you ensure that? I think both of you would have very interesting perspectives. Also on one hand for you, I think it's about all about aligning these different partners because it sounds very wonderful that they collaborate. But I can also imagine that they also sometimes compete for the same funding, they compete for the same uh, people, huh? <laughs> skills. Yeah. yeah, and it's an aspect of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Even uh, in the real life biological ecosystem, there is uh, yeah. uh, s both the, the symbiotic uh, growth and the competition, of course. And we see that in our ecosystems at w as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the tech corruption uh, example that I just gave is a way of uh, in which we handle uh, that balance between collaboration and competition, collaboration in the early stages, then the NDAs that are uh, signed, uh, and the development within the companies into competitive uh, products. Uh, sometimes we try to organize uh, stuff. So uh, with one partner, we go to this, this grant opportunity and with another, we go to another uh, opportunity. So that's also something that mm -hmm. we do if we think that is fits. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act. Uh, yeah. I think uh, the, uh, it's not realistic to create a world without competition and some mm -hmm. level of competition is healthy, but not unbridled competition with uh, with cutthroat. Uh, uh, racing to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. yeah. Good. Yeah, and Elena, maybe final remark also on the yeah, idea Maybe a last word. Yeah. I, I would actually like to question this dichotomy and, and, and that it's fighting each other. I think we need there is something healthy in competition. Mm -hmm. That's also yeah. why, you know, you, you're 
you're ambitious yeah. to to reach your goals and so on the, we should talk about uh the the conditions for the competition mm -hmm. and there we are back to the framework conditions exactly. and i think that's also coming because i'm always with a european perspective very important when we talk about creating the framework conditions for european universities that's also you you all somehow also compete between the alliances somehow yeah. there is a limited uh, you know uh, amount of funding and so on and there is collaboration that has always been a characteristic of the european university the landscape mm -hmm. um and then we we have to to talk about uh, how to find maybe a bit more of a def more of a level playing field because um we have so many so differences in the hi national higher education systems in of terms course. of funding regulation uh, and so on that it's not really equal currently mm. and I'm, I'm not sure we we will get there but that's something we should talk about when we try to foster collaboration yeah. improve the framework conditions so that we can have a fair competition i see well thank you very much i would like to close by saying that all three of you work for very interesting organizations as well that i would recommend everyone to check out as it works at the brightlands campuses a lot of information available but do uh, check it out if you would like to find examples of uh, regional collaboration here in this context. And Elena and colleagues are working on very interesting reports and also organizing conferences on European Universities Association uh, collaboration. So also check that out. And uh, Yusuo Kai is uh, yeah, continuing his research in this regard and uh, hopefully also some of his ideas and this uh, of his colleagues uh, can actually also support you in your work. Uh, I also would like to mention that this question of framework conditions, it feels like we are a bit left with this. But I'm happy with this because this is one of the central topics for the closing roundtable we'll have. This is all about creating the framework conditions and also the work of the European Commission and the national ministries in this regard. And I really hope, and I'm not going to moderate that panel, but my dear colleague uh, Daniela Trani will do so. But this will be one of the key topics there. So uh, this is not left open. We'll get back to this. Thank you very much for coming to Maastricht, and I hope to see you back soon. Thank, Thank you. You. Thank you. <laughs> you can leave the, the microphones on the floor. Um, yeah, we're going online now to the dig digital sphere. Um, we're going to France. Uh, Maastricht is calling in. That's Mr. Combi. Hello. Good afternoon, Professor Combi. How are you? Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm very glad that you're joining us uh, from France. I made the guess that you were calling in from Paris, but it might be Lyon. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> From Lyon. Uh, I will briefly yes. introduce you and then I'll give you the floor for a talk of about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Combi, you're a, prof uh, you're a professor. Um, you're a currently the project manager for European Universities and International Cooperation at the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. And you formerly served as the president of Jean Moulin uh, Lyon, Trois University, from 2012 to 2020. And you will present your view on how to collaborate in terms of research. Thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Madam President of the University of Maastricht, Chairwoman of the Alliance Youth, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the French Embassy and the Netherlands Ministry, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the European Commission, ladies and gentlemen, President and Rector of all university, Dear colleague, dear student, dear all. Uh, for beginning, I'm really sorry to be not with you today, but I'm very happy to have the, the opportunity of this keynote. First of all, I would like to highlight the profound transformation of the international strategy of French establishment over the past 10 years. The success of European University in France is an obvious translation of this paradigm shift. Just as a reminder, Today, 38 French establishments participate in one of the 44 alliances already created, a number that will increase further with the next two codes for tenders, 2023 and 2024. In my opinion, it will exceed about 50 French establishments in the 60 alliance which will have been created. As I have stressed on several occasions, the interest on the question of European University is no longer a political issue in France. All establishments that are not yet in an alliance opt to join one or participate in the construction of a new alliance. Finally, most of those who are not sure of succeeding 
want to build or are in the process of building consortia very, very much inspired by the model of alliance. And also hoping not to be forgotten by the Europe of the university. On this last question, I think it's very important to remember that European universities must be a driving force for transformation, but not to the detriment of other establishments which will not be alliance, but which nevertheless represent 90% of European universities. The positive aspect of the uh, alliance underlined by the establishments which justify this commitment are numerous and known. I will not enumerate them while I or know them. I would simply remind you that among these positive aspects, everyone underlined the experimental dimension of the alliance, but also their plurality. There is no single model, no uniform rule, because the interests of institution vary. And so though they are international strategy with different models, model based on ecosystem, other in a form of more fundamental research, etc., etc. A variety of models often explained by the more or less strong integration strategy desired by the alliance partners. There are two very important factors to be considered by the both states and the European Commission if we want the success of this alliance project. Sylvie Retailleau, who minister in France, is convinced. I remind you one of these statements at the Versailles Forum in June 2021. She said, in my opinion, the key idea is not to force anyone to conform to a model or a system. On the contrary, we want to let French and European establishment experiment by giving them road guidelines, sorry, such as promoting mobility, but without imposing a binding framework. It is therefore for us to support different models by giving them the freedom to experiment according to their project. To sum up, we can already say that the alliance are not a simple additional layer of international, but that there are and must be a variation of the international strategy of the establishment within the framework of concerted national and European strategy. Since I have just mentioned the French Minister Sylvie Retailleau, I would like to underline the very great interest and the very great attention paid by the Ministry of Higher Education to alliance with French and Dutch partners, including, of course, youth who, who has just integrated Serban Nouvelle Paris 3. But obviously, not only youth, but also Unarpa, Charm, Epicure, Engagiu, Enlight, Annual, Hortech, Neurotech EU, Invest, Aurora, etc. There are only three alliances with Netherlands University without French University today. Um, at least there should be 11 with both countries in 2024. I would also like to recall French conviction that European universities are a major element of the future European area of higher education and research. The minister is convinced of the importance of the European anchoring of French university and the internationalization of research. She wishes to support the effort of French researchers and academics to participate in European projects and in particular with the Netherlands. She is also convinced that the quality, complementarity, mobility and actions that this European consortia will produce will strengthen the international attractiveness of university. One of these recent proof of this conviction of this keen interest and of the close follow-up it grants to European University is its last press release of February 3. In this press release, she salutes the commitment of French higher education establishment to experimentation in the 10 projects selected from the two codes, European Label for Gen Degrees and the Legal Statute of Alliance. It is delight that French higher education institutions are participating directly or with the European islands of which they are members in nine of these 10 projects. 
Silver Tail is pleased with this collective success and specifies that the Ministry of Higher Education and Research will provide French institution with its support and expertise in experiment and that it will also facilitate the dissemination of the lesson drawn from this experiment. An experiment which should not be limited to the winners alone, but which should mobilize all the establishment in the exchange of good practice. It can be noted that this result confirms once again the mobilization of French establishment for the initiative of European universities. This interest of the ministry and its support is also confirmed by other very concrete evidence. Following the announcement in the summer of 2222 by the European Commission of the renewal of 16 European universities launched in 2019 and the creation of four new alliances, nearly 30 million euros have been located in under the French 2030 plane to the 21 French partners establishment. As stated in the Ministry Press release, this report, the amount of which has increased by 30% on average compared to the allocation allocated to European universities to date, should enable this establishment to increase their cooperation activities within Alliance, in particular by deploying the research and innovation dimension. A dimension, the research, to which the Minister is very, very sensitive in France. If other member states also contribute, I'm proud to point out that France is the most committed, just ahead of the Netherlands, then Germany, Poland, Italy, Greece, Spain. Thanks to them to their contribution, and today in particular, thanks a lot to Netherlands. It is absolutely fundamental that the state talk to each other and work together on this subject. If this funding reflects the interest and commitment of the ministry, it's also explained that she's following the results and development very carefully. In fact, the ministry is attentive to answering that the transformation underway at the level of the alliances benefits the level of the French establishment themselves. This is, again, a very, very important point for the minister. Today, if uncertainties remain on the future and the model of future European University, and more generally on the structuring and organization of the University and Scientific Europe of tomorrow, it is unlikely or not conservative that we observe a backsliding by establishment in their international commitment, and in particular in Europe. This obviously does not mean that the construction is simple and without difficulties. The question remains numerous, and we know them for the most part. I will only mention a few. Some of them were discussed this morning in Maastricht. European diploma on the status of islands, subjects on which not all vision always meet, but everyone is working on them, in particular with the framework of the Commission's call for tenders on double and statute alliance on establishing states of Europe. Evaluation on accreditation. I think that the agency risk finding themselves between the need and the necessity for a European cooperation, but also on a competitive mode. How to read this, how to deal sorry, with this problem? Should we create an agency, a European agency, using the existing one, sometimes very different? In any case, it will be necessary to work in confidence. More generally, how to think about the future framework program for research and innovation and the issues it invests to take up such a social challenge, scientific excellence, competitiveness, competitiveness, sorry, or the evolution of the labor market. As some subject, should we create a dedicated European program to increase the impact of university in terms of research, innovation, and education? For me, it's essential that the skills are taken in account in the research and framework program for innovation. Finally, and within the framework of how can we align a real model of research and training alliance, also and above all, the issue of funding and in particular that of research, a fundamental question for the future of alliance and which is part of the new priority areas of the European research area on its action, in particular through, through Action 30 of the ERA, 
that France has the honor of culturing over the Queen Martin and Diaz. I note that in my opinion, this last question goes beyond the framework of alliance alone and that it concerns other model. Sorry, my fault. And it concerns other model on highly developed cooperative networks. We know that Richard did not always very strongly developed in the alliance and that the university in France or in other country that are best ranked in international research ranking are most often not ranked with partner of the European Alliance. It is obviously essential to progress in this area, but I do not believe that we can limit ourselves to building with only alliance on this subject, at least in the short term. I also note that in any case, it will be necessary to share, to work in partnership, converge, encourage mutual learning of practice, facilitate the exchange and sharing of practice. This is an essential step in the construction of the European research area on European higher education. I still hear that the goal is among other things, achieving excellence and inclusion in science and value creation through integrated and institutional cooperation of higher education institutions. It will obviously be necessary to explain clearly what is meant by this term, which is likely to fuel a lot of debate among almost all the actors. What excellence, what inclusion, how far cooperation, and in particular, institutional cooperation. The solution to achieve the goal could be to develop a European Excellence Initiative. Here again, what do we expect from an initiative of excellence? The field of investigation can be, can be wide or much narrower depending on the angle chosen. In any case, the plurality and diversity of islands will undoubtedly suppose different models which reveal several models of excellence. To conclude, I would like to emphasize that if the European University are today a factor of transformation, but also of up and enthusiasm in the establishment, the development cannot take place without a commitment and strong political support from the head of establishment themselves, rectors and president, and without their force of conviction. On this point, I would like to thank the president of the French and Netherlands University that participated in an ion for their investment, but also their teams for their commitment and their conviction that I can measure at each of my meetings with them. I am convinced of the multilinguism, and it's why I'm going to dare, even if I risk imposing to her Dutch friend a real torture. Okay. But it's more really undark, even see in fine midar. Thank you. <laughs> Really sorry, but I can't tell with you more long time. It's Merci okay, Professor Comby. <laughs> your, your regards are very well received, your words as well. For a long time, I thought the national motto of France was uh, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, but you made me reconsider this in the res respect of research. It's commitment, courage, and confidence. Thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye. <Thank> you. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, time has come for the closing round table. Uh, to wrap it all up, I think I'm very excited about this. I consider this the icing on the cake, not to put more pressure on my colleague, uh, Dr. Daniela Trani, who is coming up front now. I'll briefly introduce you actually to our audience because you have been joining us all day. You're also, I think, a familiar face for many people in the audience, but I think you deserve a good introduction. Um, uh, Dr. Daniela Trani uh, was until recently the very first director of the Youth Alliance which is coordinated by Maastricht University and one of the main developers of the pilot proposal selected by the European Commission as one of the first 17 pilot European universities initiatives. You won't say that yourself too much, but in evaluations of the European Commission, the Youth Alliance received very high scores over a long time. And then this- always say this. Of course, okay, always good. <laughs> the there you go, you were always the top scoring ones, which is a very, yeah, a very big accomplishment. And in this role, you coordinated the strategy, policy and public affairs of one of the fir very first European universities. And you previously also served in several senior policy advisory roles at Maastricht University, advising on research and internationalization. And today you're the moderator for our closing uh, roundtable. 
to enjoy. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I'll go with this mic because then I can uh, move around a bit. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Yobo, for this very nice introduction. And thank you for staying with us so long. I know it's very hard without a coffee break, so I appreciate it even more. Uh, but we hope to really pay you back for the loyalty with our wonderful last uh, round table. We have five excellent speakers. Two of them are uh, with us online and three are on site. Uh, before I introduce them, Yop, I would like to say happy birthday to you because it's your birthday today. So I'm putting you on the spot. I'll spare you the happy birthday song in Italian, you know, buon compleanno, but we'll toast later at the networking drinks. Uh, but let's go back to our uh, panel. Um, we have had a very interesting day. I think I have been really uh, absorbing all the wisdom, all the thoughts that our speakers, the colleagues, uh, the facilitators have shared with us today. and. This is the perfect moment for us to have a discussion with the uh, um, experts from different stakeholder groups. So we have ministry representatives, but we have also a commission representative, student, um, and uh, uh, yeah. So we let's uh, let's introduce them. I will start with the. Uh, I don't know if you can see them because they are not on the main screen. I see them on the back. So if we could uh, project Tine and Siegfried on the screen, that's great. Good afternoon, uh, Tine. Good afternoon, Siegfried. Welcome here. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, so let me introduce you, uh, Tine. Tine Delva is deputy head of unit in the higher education department of the Commission Directorate General for Education and Culture. Tine is fully involved in European uh, universities initiatives since the very beginning and also uh, very much involved in the European strategy for universities. So she'll bring us the uh, very valuable perspective from the European Commission. Then Siegfried Martinez Diez uh, is the head of department on uh, higher European higher education and research area strategies from the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. Welcome Siegfried also to you. We are busy missing you both here. So we hope next time we'll be able to welcome you on site in this beautifully rainy Maastricht. You are missing out a lot on the weather here today. And then let me uh, invite the other panelists to join me here on stage. Anne-Marie de Rauter, Head of Department Europe at the Ministry of Education, Culture and Sciences in the Netherlands. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie focuses on uh, European collaboration on education, culture, science and emancipation. And I think the name of her department is a very strong statement from the Dutch Ministry Yes, Europa. Europe is a priority, clearly, for uh, uh, the Dutch Ministry of Education, Research and, and Culture, and we are very pleased with this development. Uh, Tanguy Gibert, member of the Executive Committee of the European Students' Union. Welcome, Tanguy. And also, I have congratulations for Tanguy, who has just been elected new Vice President of the, uh, of the Board of the European Students' Union. So good luck on this new <laughs> role. And last but not least, Peter van der Heijden, Independent Higher Education Strategy Advisor. Peter has worked uh, uh, previously at the European Commission for uh, about uh, 20 plus years um, in different uh, departments. He has also been the head of the sector at the higher education policy and contributed to the Erasmus program, the Bologna process and the uh, ERA. So as you can uh, uh, see, we have really very strong speakers. I would like a logistical change, Peter. If you could move to this seat, I will be able to look at you all during our discussion. So uh, 
we, uh, Tine and Siegfried, uh, have had here very interesting discussions today. And as you know, this morning we had a workshop uh, on four different topics that are really relevant for European, uh, uh, Euro uh, European universities alliances, but also for the wider education sector. And we have had then some ideas developed and shared by uh, representatives of different groups on topics that are, according to them, crucial for uh, uh, the coming phase of European universities. They have been uh, um, pitched, but since you were not here when uh, we had our uh, uh, debriefing, and some colleagues also joined us on site all in the afternoon, I will uh, summarize each of them. And in case I miss anything, I've missed anything major uh, for the rapporteurs of the different groups, please raise a hand, but I'll not give you more than 10 seconds to correct <laughs> me. So also keep that in mind. So the first topic was governance. And the idea selected uh, attained the composition of the uh, governance bodies, also at the executive level of the alliances. According to our colleagues, having the involvement of different stakeholders groups outside the university community is crucial. Uh, not only to take in the right input on what universities should focus on, but also to connect our communities, academic communities, the researchers, the lecturers, but I would say even the students, with the, the broader, broader society and with the local ecosystem. So they are pointing out for governance, having a, an approach that is based on only having universities uh, and partners within the alliances driving the show, it's not the way to go. And I am the moderator, so I'll put things black and white sometimes and also be a bit challenging. I think that's also my role, right, Peter? Right. And we will not look for consensus always. I like that suggestion from this morning. The second topic is purpose. And what I really liked in the pitch on purpose was that the group of colleagues, students, experts, didn't come back saying, oh, we should do this, or universities are not doing that but rather they uh, identified an element that could be brought in to connect the universities to the community, also to disseminate what we are trying to achieve. So this connectivity element was very interesting. Uh, and the idea was not to only use the regular channels you know, of academic meetings, conferences, like the one we are having today, but also bring European universities into the communities via social activities. That could be baking activity, uh, could be just events uh, like Euro Festival. It's uh, a relevant uh, example now. But basically make it a bit more human, I would say. And go down from the pedestal on which sometimes maybe we're standing as academic uh, uh, institutions. <laughs> then the third topic was implementation of joint programs. And also here it was really uh, good to hear of a suggestion. The group brought back a proposal. We encounter some challenges when implementing joint programs. Um, also regarding the use of Erasmus funding. There are things that are not possible. How about we create an ex ex Erasmus extra kind of framework that introduces elements that allow universities in alliances to work together smoothly and to uh, support the students to take advantage of their educational opportunities without having to always find ad hoc solutions. So that was also a very interesting one. And as an element of this approach, the colleagues really emphasized the importance on, on having the students in the driving seat when it comes to develop these tools. And the reason was that students are the one that at the end have to support themselves. They know how the funding should be spent. So make them part of the development of such a program. Last but not least, we had funding 
uh, where things kind of also came back together. Uh, and the colleagues working on the funding uh, challenge uh, highlighted how often the funding strategy is an ad hoc one. So, oh, there is this open call, let's go for it, rather than saying, okay, what are we trying to achieve? What's our goal, our purpose? And which are the funding opportunities instruments that best serve our purpose, and not in the short term, but long term? So think of what you want to achieve and then plan in a programmatic way. Um, so these were the four pitches. If I have missed anything major, please raise your hand with the 10 seconds in mind. And otherwise, I will give the word to our uh, panelists, because what they will do, they will share with us their reflections on the topics and the ideas that were highlighted. Uh, they will have a maximum of three minutes, and after that, I will take some questions from the audience and we will have uh, a, a discussion. Of course, I also have some questions, but mine, I'll keep them you know, in my back pocket. Um, shall we start with the, our online panelists? So I'll give the word to Tine or Siegfried uh, first. Tine, would you like to start to open uh, the, the discussion? Yes, Daniela, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. We can uh, hear you very uh, clear. A pleasure. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here uh, with you today and to have heard such an excellent summary of the discussions uh, this morning. Um, because as you know from, from the Commission side, we are, we are convinced on the transformational potential of the European universities. We really believe that you can uh, unlock the full potential of higher education uh, for skills and knowledge, for the engines for excellence, education, research and innovation. Uh, we really believe that that is exactly what the alliances can do as a, also as a flagship initiative of the European strategy for universities. Um, with regard to funding, uh, the issue that you are that you raised last um, with the Erasmus Plus budget, uh, we have substantially increased it. Uh, the current programming peri period to 1.1 billion. Um, it's almost a tripling of the budget uh, per alliance compared to the pilot phase, bringing up the maximum funding level to 14.4 uh, 14 14 million per alliance. So three times the budget from the first phase. And uh, we have also put in place a sustainable six years uh, funding model to sustain 60 European university alliances until 2028 and 2029, respectively. Uh, but we know that the, the scale of the needs and, and the level of ambition and depth of the cooperation, uh, we know that the financial needs linked to this uh, are very substantial. And we also realize that European funding alone cannot cover all the needs uh, of, of you as, as alliances. So this is why the continued commitment on the side of the member states is crucial. Uh, and picking up on the suggestion you made, for example, to fund mobilities that are currently not possible under Erasmus+, Plus, one could also think of using member state funding uh, for that to make sure that all is complementary. Uh, and we are very happy to see now that many member states uh, are really active contributing to support their national higher education institutions part of an alliance through various approaches. Um, be, being there in the Netherlands, uh, I'm sure um, you also very welcome the, the latest developments in the Netherlands to also support the Dutch universities parts uh, of an alliance. Uh, and when we look towards the future, uh, with the midterm review of the programs and the, the multi-annual budgets uh, of the Union, uh, we will concentrate efforts to design a robust and creative proposal for more encompassing funding, funding models uh, for post-2027, really engaging European-level funding from multiple programs and also seeking for synergies and, and contributions from the national level. And we intend to work together with the Alliance and the Member States to define this investment pathway uh, that could work for all. But um, based on, on what you mentioned before, it's of course also needed uh, to, to remove the, the administrative uh, barriers that, that are there. For that reason, uh, we, had, um, we had proposed a council recommendation 
Organization on Building Bridges for Effective European Higher Education cooperation. Um, and it is very encouraging to see that the first results are already there, with several countries already adapting or envisaging to adapt their national legislations. And then also um, what I think you, you discussed this morning, that uh, following the rich but also challenging first years uh, with, for example, a pandemic in between, uh, your, the alliances are now at the turning point. You are expected to deploy and mainstream your activities to more faculties and, and more students. Um, it's, it's really... Um, um, uh, the next level to scale it up. It really calls for transformation at the institutional level. Um, and first, uh, for us, this requires implementing uh, real new governance models for your alliances, embarking the leadership of your higher education institution, but also reaching out to many more students, staff, and researchers across the many faculties in your institutions and at all levels with a long term vision going much further beyond any existing cooperation model uh, and involving also your innovation ecosystem, as you also rightfully pointed out uh, in, in the wrap-up from this morning's discussions. Uh, but secondly, uh, to reach the level of ambition of your alliances, it will also be needed to have an articulation within an alliance between all the partners, institutions strategy and the alliance strategy. Uh, because if the strategies of the individual partner universities are, are not aligned with the strategy of the uh, alliance, of course, uh, it will be difficult to, to work together. And uh, the alignment of the strategies, uh, for us, the benefit goes both ways. Uh, the alliance will be fueled by each partner's contribution, while the partner institutions are getting unseen opportunities uh, for transformation. And the last uh, point for us, the third one that is critical for transformation, is to really maintain the drive and, and the spirits of the staff and academics and, and students involved to implement and navigate your vision. For that, a strong leadership uh, is needed and also a valorization of all the efforts and intense dedication uh, within your alliances. Uh, for us, it's key that all of you working on alliances, that your investment within your institution individually and for, for the alliance as a whole is crucial so that we can transcend the typical project approach and, and um, aim for a true European university. Uh, we are not there yet, so of course, a European university takes time to, to be put in place. So we need, we continue to need your help and support uh, to make all the alliances become sustainable in the long run. And for this, we also see uh, a potential um, for your alliances to team up and to learn from each other. And in this sense, of course, uh, events like these uh, promoting cooperation uh, are more than welcome. So, Daniela, uh, the floor is back yours. Um, happy you, to Tina. hear the other views of the other panelists. Thank you, Tina. And thanks for uh, illustrating so clearly what are the, the views uh, from the Commission on these very important topics. And I have to agree completely with you that this kind of events are what keeps it going. Because this is where we learn from each other, we share also the challenges, but we really feel that we are not alone. There is a, a tremendous amount of energy uh, in, within all the alliances and from all groups that is allowing the developments to really become a reality. And I am sure that this will help us all uh, to really integrate them in the, in the work of our individual institutions. Um, Siegfried, I would like to give you the floor now for your uh, reflection. Thank you very much, Daniela. Do you hear me? Yeah? Yes, very clearly. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, very glad to be with you uh, this afternoon. And sorry for not sharing on site the bad weather. Uh, and right now, we have sunny weather in France. But uh, earlier in the, morning, in the morning, there was uh, a bit uh, rainy anyway. So uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for organizing uh, this event. Thank you for the studio Europa Maastricht, the UFE Alliance, the Maastricht University, and uh, of course, the, the French Embassy. Uh, I think this, uh, this, this, this enlightens the, the strong partnership that we have with our uh, Dutch colleagues uh, regarding, uh, in particular, higher education and research cooperation. It was uh, highlighted recently with the official visit of the French uh, president of the Republic. Um, back to the, 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 different, uh, the different pitches. Thank you very much. They are really all very interesting. 
and I, I would like to 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 highlight so, some of them uh, quite quite quickly. Uh, first, uh, the question of, uh, of 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 funding. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I, I'm not quite sure that to have un un understood what the proposal was, but uh, I think it's really interesting uh, uh, beyond. Uh, the question of coordination of national and European films, and I will get back to this. But beyond this, to look uh, to look at the, uh, how to get more uh, private uh, own resources of the uh, through the alliances or through their, their partners. Uh, in France, recently, we launched a specific call uh, that is called an acceleration strategy for the development of higher education uh, institutions. So basically, over a period of 10 years, we provide funds to hire people that have specific talents, enabling for first for instance, what they, they have the choice, huh? but enabling them for, uh, for hiring the personnel to uh, develop uh, European projects to, to more uh, to be more uh, effective in developing and submitting European proposals, not only Erasmus. Uh, second, also uh, get funds from the uh, long uh, long life uh, learning. So, for instance, uh, micro credentials and uh, all the all, all this um, kind of LLL uh, LLL aspects. But also uh, mecena, so get uh, get get funds from private uh, private partners, and also exploiting when possible the the, the immobilier, the, the the patrimoine of the of the of the higher education institutions. And I think this is. Quite Quite interesting to have in mind relating to the governance proposal with having the, the stakeholders external stakeholders being part of the governance today we have more than 100 uh, external stakeholders and i think this is really important to 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 have them on board and exploit them i think for, for instance of eciu that they, they have partners from uh, outside of europe uh, they have partners from, from mexico uh, but also the, the local partners enterprises and they are all i think eager to to develop uh, 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 more, uh, more, more um, tight uh, uh, cooperation partnerships with the with the alliances. Um, coming back to the to the to the funding per se. So the question of whether uh, a specific program is uh, nece necessary for the alliances, or is it useful to, or is it necessary to to stick under the usual uh, actual uh, framework? I think I agree with, with Tina. I think we have to think right now about the next the, the next phase and what we want to, to push forward uh, uh, with uh, with uh, on, on the French side is the idea of having a, a, a single but a single instrument uh, that will uh, that will that would be able that would enable the alliances to submit uh, uh, comprehensive uh, strategies for higher education research and innovation. Well, it depends on the strategies, of the, but they would submit this to a fund, which is composed of the Commission and and the member states. And uh, so through this integrated part, we would be able to fund them over a long term perspective. We have examples, uh, for instance, the EIT, uh, which funds over a period of 14 years, uh, KICS, uh, which are composed of uh, higher education institutions, but also all, all types of external stakeholders, for, for example, in industry. So we would like to, to think about this uh, with our different partners. And I think in particular about the Dutch partners, uh, because uh, as you rightly said, you know, a lot of member states are investing now uh, in their higher education that are member of matters, but we don't know what other member states do. And, and, in, and in particular, we don't have this thinking about uh, having a complementary, thinking, uh, complementary funding of activities that are not eligible uh, under the current Erasmus uh, funding. For instance, in France, we have chosen to fund research activities, but that was uh, our main aim from the beginning. But if we have an alliance with Dutch, German, Spanish partners, we don't have this kind of framework that enable us to discuss and say, okay, what are you funding exactly and how can we complement each other as a, as a synergy? So I think this is uh, something that we should uh, we should think about. And I'm still uh, too long, so uh, but I will get back to, to other ideas later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Siegfried. Can you hear me? I think, I oh, okay, now it's working again. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate that you had some very concrete uh, points that we can pick up again later. Uh, but before we get there, we have 
still our three panelists on stage. So, Anne-Marie, would you like to share with us your thoughts on uh, what we have discussed today? Yes, of course, yes, I would like to. Um, it works, the mic? Thank you. Um, when I listen to Tina, the, um, the ambitions are very high of the European Commission and maybe of everybody from these European universities. And this is why I liked your four presentations this morning, because they were so concrete. They were really uh, from the experience, from the field, from people who work every day with European universities. So for me, that was really nice to compare these practical um, pitches with the big ambitions and the, the, the dreams, as we could say. So, and if I go to your uh, proposals, the first was on, uh, on governance. And what I really liked was the connection between the, the, the ecosystem or the context or the regions that was uh, in this uh, pitch. Um, and um, what, is, what I thought could maybe be a nice contribution is the, the participation of universities of applied science here because they have a lot of experience with connecting to the surroundings of a University of Applied Science. And if you look at the numbers of universities of applied science participating in the uh, European University Initiative, it's very few. I think there are three out of so many. So I think especially here, there could be opportunities to uh, involve these universities of applied science. Um, on the second, uh, on purpose, it of course, it was nice to hear these examples of, of social activities to involve the people and get the, get more connections. Um, but what I it's nice to say here that it, it were bottom up uh, initiatives of the people in these universities, um, and this bottom up approach, of course, is nothing a ministry is involved in. Like in the Netherlands, the universities have their autonomy. We don't get involved, not even in the content of a European university, let alone in the social activities. So here I would say it's a lovely uh, initiative. I understand uh, the, the added value, but for us as a ministry, uh, we, we don't get very involved. Um, the third was about the Erasmus Extra Plus, which I thought was at least a funny naming already. Um, and I, I start by saying, yes, the Erasmus Plus scholarships are very complicated. There's a lot of rules involved. So any call for simplification is easy to understand. And as a, a ministry, we definitely, I think we're already for over 10 years, we are urging for simplification of Erasmus Plus in general, but the scholarships in particular. Um, yeah, <laughs> and we will continue to do that, yeah, for sure. Um, but what I liked in this in this pitch was that you're gonna evaluate with the students if this uh, is working. And I think it's always good to evaluate, but it's very good to listen to the students, how they experience it. So the, the, the participation of the students in this pitch, I particularly liked. Um, and I would urge, and the ministry also urges for, um, involve your, your students and, um, and have them represented in all the, the, the decision boards of your European university. Um, and then I go to the, the final one, the funding. Um, well, I actually must say I like this even better than the other three because it's such a good timing to start to talk about the funding now. I mean, the first group is now in the fourth year, but there's a new group starting. They have to start even being a European university. And to think now about sustainable funding is a, a very good moment. Um, and this uh, maybe leads me to say that in the Netherlands, we give the universities a lump sum funding. So they get a lump sum, and then the university, as being autonomous, they decide how to spend their money. So if, if we talk about uh, national contributions, you have to know that in the Netherlands, we give a lump sum, and the institutions are autonomous. We have decided to, to give some extra money um, but not to the amount that the French uh, do. <laughs> um, but uh, normally we give the lump sum. And so we're really interested in how will this work, this financial sustainability of the universities. So we'd like to, as a ministry, learn with you what the experiences are. Um, and do we need uh, sustainable funding generated by itself or should we have uh, a sustainable 
financial situation for the university within the lump sum? These are questions that we want to learn with you together. So, uh, um, thank you, Anne-Marie. Thirty-three minutes. You were perfectly in time, <laughs> and also really concrete. Uh, and I think uh, uh, this is music for our ears, right, Tangi? To hear that also the Dutch ministry is really in favor and strong supporter of having students closely involved, having them at the center of these developments. And I will also comment on some of the inspiring things you just said, Anne Marie, but this will be later, after the last two uh, statements, and to you the, the word then, Tangi. Yes, so thank you, Daniela. Thank you for, for the invitation and for having uh, me and the students uh, through, uh, through the participation of ESU, the organization I represent just for the people who don't know ESU. We are the European Students' Union. We are representing 20 million students across uh, the European continent with 40 countries represented with uh, 45 organizations, including uh, FAJ for France and ESO and LSBB for the Netherlands, um, so it was important for me to remind the name of our uh, organization. Um, I, I really like the, um, the discussions uh, since uh, that we had this morning because when I was involved in the, the French uh, National Student Union Lafage, when I was international officer at the very beginning of the speech uh, made by Macron, I, um, th the first conference like this we had was really talking about the, the ideas and how we should uh, create and imagine the, the European universities. And in this conference, I have the impression that it's almost the first time that I really have the impression that we are talking about really concrete themes and really concrete stuff that we need to achieve because I think that, that the time of ideas, I mean, we, we still need to, to keep the ideas concrete and living, but, um, but now I have the impression that we have passed this time a bit and that now we need to start talking more concretely on things that the students and staff and all the people involved in the ma make the un European universities living on concrete things that they can uh, that they can touch, and it's clearly what we talked this morning in the working groups. I mean, in the four of them, it was really concrete stuff like the new European uh, Erasmus program, this um, this framework for the for the fundings, um, even the social meetings uh, on the on the purpose uh, working group. I mean, even it's uh, and I agree on the fact that I, I was expecting something else for this uh, for this uh, workshop on, on purpose. Uh, I was expecting talking about ideas on w why the European University should exist, and we talked about meetings and how we can and we need to socialize between all the people that are actually working on European University. So it, it also showed the fact that we really need needs right now to um, work more concretely on, on, on stuff that actually exists and not only on, oh yeah, maybe we need to do that in like five, three, uh, five, seven, eight, nine, ten years, which was the, 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 the discourse at the very beginning of the initiative. And it was normal because uh, in, in such huge uh, initiative, it's normal to, to start with ideas, but right now we... we Start uh, we start talking on that, so so I, I really I really love this and to more concretely on the on, on the different uh, workshops, the one on uh, on governance. Uh, it's really interesting uh, to talk about how we can involve the different stakeholders on on the area and how we can we have to work on with the ecosystem uh, because. I'm also talking with my personal experience, but um, coming from a, a field of study where, uh, where I am in a remote areas campus, in a really, really, really small um, city, very far from the university we depend to. I mean, um, it's really important to also think about this really uh, these campuses that are far from, um, from from the main university, and how we can also connect them to the European universities because they have a lot of things to to give uh, and a lot of inputs uh, to give, especially for how to include the students from remote uh, remote areas, and so, um, they all also think about if we do not do this, we will create way more faster, a two-speed system between the different type of HEIs that we have. And it's all really something that I think uh, we, we have to be really careful about because um, also link about the, on the issues of finances, but if we choose to finance only the, uh, the, the higher education institution that are involved in an alliance, it will create some differentiation in the fundings received by the governments. Um, received by the HIs from the governments um, 
uh, in comparison with the HIs that are not involved in alliance, and it will, I mean, there is a danger to create a two-split system. So it's really something that we also need to take care about because otherwise th the first person who will, uh, will be injured by this will be the students and uh, I will also go uh, just see that the Erasmus uh, extra program with the full involvement of students, obviously it's amazing and I love the, uh, the idea and if you need some people to work on this, <laughs> I will I'm be here. Thank you, Tangi. This is really the concrete evidence of why we need the students involved because this wisdom and this level of concreteness uh, that comes from ideas you shared like do not reinvent the wheel. Yep. There are already very strong practices in different institutions that we can just connect and upskill. I think that is a, one of the key points and that I would also like to uh, discuss again later. But Peter, you have a very big responsibility now because all your colleagues <laughs> were perfectly in, in time and this doesn't mean you have more time. So that's a bad news for you. You will have to still stay okay. within your three minutes. Uh, but we look forward to hearing your closing uh, statement before we go and uh, debate. Okay, there were four pitches. Uh, the first was on governance. We should involve the ecosystem actors, internal, external, get the students on board, the companies, etc. I agree. Yes, get them on board, but forget the advisory councils and forget the boards. Get the actors involved in the real work, which are the task teams. If you have a task team on incubators, you can get the Chamber of Commerce join the task team every three months for an afternoon. Uh, if you have something with, uh, with learning, get the students on, on board in the curricula group next to the director of studies. That's the way to do it. Those advisory boards are just occasions to meet. They're just photo opportunities. They always say, ah, what are we doing here and what can we say? No, make it concrete. I heard a good example this morning. And if you are, as a student, are in a task team curricula or you are as a uh, doctoral candidate in a task team doctoral school, yes, by all means, you can join the advisory council if the rector wants to have a, a, a drink and a photo opportunity, but it's not important. Important is to be in the task teams. The task teams, 20, 25, well, how many you have in the alliance, that's where the alliance is working. Not at the work package from the Apple and definitely not in the advisory councils. Point two. Uh, this goes hand in hand with the community building, which was defi uh, defined as a purpose. It is a purpose, the social, the cultural, the sportive, all very nice. It demonstrates how local life is. Europe lives in the regions. The alliances as organizations live in the task teams. And the alliances as education and other actors, they live Locally, they don't live European. You can't do a social cultural event uh, shaking hands with the citizens at alliance level. You can have an occasional uh, web, web meeting or something for that, but it's really local. But it's wonderful, and the international aspect is that you learn from the others how to do it. So it's the benchmarking, and uh, each of us have experience involving citizens. Let's learn from each other. The next point was the uh, joint programs. Haha, <laughs> yes, yes, but not in the sense, uh, but in, no, let's be positive. Uh, joint programs in the sense of collaborative teaching and collaborative learning. Nine universities, six, five, three, work together in teaching, work together in learning. Stop the fixation on regulation and accreditation. The pitch says less rules by one of the speaker, and then the other speaker said new rules. Well, less rules, yes, new rules, scary. I am not sure that we need a European degree. We have 650,000 Erasmus students, and if they show you the, the where what they have done in, in the four years of studies, and you take off your glasses, and you say, ah, you stayed abroad, then you came back, then you did a summer course, then you did an online course, then you graduated, what a wonderful joint degree. I say to my niece, he said, Uncle Peter, it's not a joint degree. I did it myself, my professor agreed, and the exam committee. So we have 650,000 joint degrees every year, every year, plus the handful overpaid, spoiled joint degrees that we keep thinking that we must develop. In material sense, we have it, job done, 650,000. 
And the students, as the pitch says, put the student in the driving seat. The student composes the program with the permission of the exam committee and, and the professors on both sides. They, the, the students with their professors, create the famous individual learning path. 650,000 every year. And they include short courses, hopefully micro-credentials, hopefully paid by individual learning accounts. We can learn so much from France in this respect. Bravo, the RNCP, an example for all of us. And it should be part of the funding formulas that you don't pay universities only for the degrees, but also for the short courses. The last point was the funding. I come to the funding issue. And there the pitch was, leave the funding rat race. Develop strategies. Take two steps back, take a deep breath, make a three to five year pr uh, program of diversifying income streams and where you can get the money for and for what purpose is the money to strengthen the apparatus of the alliance or is it for the basic tasks of the partners, education research, or is it for collaboration? If it's for collaboration, is it for the happy few collaboration, a joint degree here, some across there? Or is it to develop new formats that serve all learners? I would be in favor of the latter. Thank you, Peter. And well done also to you for staying within time. Very interesting and very sharp comments also from your side. And before we get into the discussion, because we have been running uh, late today, we will have to finish at 5 o'clock sharp. But we have for sure 15 minutes to discuss. So I would like to s first give the word to the audience to see whether you have any questions for our panelists after their very uh, triggering pitches. I don't see any hands raised right now, but. No, 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 no I just walk around to the mic and say what I need. And otherwise, I will break the ice, but I would like some questions too. So I will want to start from the last statement that you made, Peter, and that was also supported by all the other panelists about the funding, leaving the rat race. So it seems very logical, right, that you have a purpose and that you build also a strategy. But then I would want to ask uh, one of you, why do you think that universities are not doing that? Why do you think that we are often going after funding in an ad hoc way and not really having a roadmap to build a funding strategy? What are your thoughts? I see Annie Marie. Uh, you're, you're inside er the university. You, you know, you're inside the university. I'm biased, so <laughs> I would like to have an outsider perspective. The, the first thought that comes to my mind is that that's, that's the way it, it works in the European Commission. There are calls and then you have to write a proposal to win the call. So it's like it's in the system to think about um, writing a proposal that generates funds. So I do think that people actually know very well what purpose they have, where they want to go to, but the financial system works in writing, uh, filling in a form and get money for that project. So I think the universities know exactly what they want and if they have enough money and autonomy, they would work more strategically, but they are badly trained by the way it works. So that's My first really idea is very yeah. interesting. So you're saying that the system is pushing the universities to act in a certain way. Universities are following the uh, way calls work but they could be more proactive then in suggesting maybe to co-create mm. funding programs differently. Yeah. And I would say that uh, uh, we are European universities. Eh? Next year is the last round, uh, 12 places, 12 slots. I can only say it in Spanish, uh, 2024 is El Año de los Desperados. <laughs> And they will not, there will be 60, 70, 80 candidates next year. Only 12 will win. And my recommendation to them is take a deep breath. Do you think that alliance building is good for you? Do you think that your HR people, your library people, your admission people, your curricular people can learn so much for working together? If you think that this is worthwhile, make a plan, set up an alliance, look at the good, good practice of the existing European University alliances, 
pick and choose what is relevant for you and create an alliance and do so in, Ju in June, July, August, September, October this year. And then, hey, there's a call. Well, let's apply. But don't think you will get it. You create the alliance because you think it's good for you. And then you use the, the, the 14 million and any other grant that comes around, but because you have a purpose uh, that is, you do something, it's called alliance building, and it's good for you. It's not in response to a call. We, th we are grateful to the commission that they have triggered our interest in this, but now it should be owned by the institutions that want to cooperate. And if you don't, I know many that don't want to cooperate, even if they are in an alliance, well then don't. <laughs> Nobody obliges you. Thank you, Peter. I saw a hand raised in the back. Adam. There is one mic there. Uh, so if may I ask one question with, with two sub-questions, okay? Uh, I, I you can also say if there is a specific <laughs> panelist you would like to answer. Okay, so the, at least one will be for Tina and one probably for, for Peter. Um, okay, the question is about the differences in legal systems, because this is something that is still important uh, in creating, for example, curriculum, common curriculum for uh, students from different countries. And the second part of this question says, but there is also a huge difference, which I can see on the scene and on the screen between different parts of Europe. So I cannot see here any one from Eastern or Central part of Europe, which makes a huge difference in the terms of funding, in possibility of funding by governments, uh, of different culture, different legal culture, different tradition, etc. So this is something that we also really need to think about when we are discussing about uh, European University, that differences are not only within each country, not only between uh, the France and the Netherlands, for example, but probably from Polish perspective, it's even more uh, important, especially right now in present-day political situation, to think about European University as a something that we really need and want to have, okay? So, yeah, those two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Tine, would you like to begin answering uh, or responding to the remarks of Adam? Because I think they were posed more as remarks. Indeed, but um, if, if I may quickly step in with regard to the different legal systems in, in Europe, uh, of course, of course, this is part. It's a part of the the system that we have in in the field of higher education. We have a diversity of higher education, which is also a little bit our our strength because we can offer different types of education tailored to the needs uh, of, of specific parts, either with regard to personal development or be it uh, for the world of work on the labour market. Uh, but of course, when when working together then at trans transnational level, uh, this may create issues. And this is where from the Commission side, uh, we are working hard together with member states to see how these bottlenecks can be solved. We already have the Bologna tools at our disposal, um, which we are trying uh, to, to have it better in, in, uh, enforced in, in, in the member states so that it becomes easier. But of course, we're needed uh, to go a step further. And this is, for example, where, where our work towards the joint uh, European degree, Peter may disagree, uh, that's his full right, uh, but where our our um, our work on the joint European degree uh, comes in, because we, we still believe that on top of all the mobilities uh, that are currently um, um, that are currently happening, uh, this can really have an added value, um, as, as this can really demonstrate the added value of, of a, a comprehensive, well thought through curriculum uh, at the, the European level. Um, we know, of course, that, that further efforts are needed uh, on this front. Uh, that's why, of course, uh, having member states like uh, the Netherlands and, and France here uh, around the table is, is very welcome. But we haven't forgotten, of course, about our uh, Central and Eastern uh, European partners. There are also uh, for it's one of the uh, actions on the horizon uh, with the one of the best geographical uh, balance. So we are uh, the call conditions were as such that they are really favorable also for inclusion of uh, universities 
universities from, from different parts of Europe. Um, and we are really trying also to, to make sure that the, there is sufficient buy-in uh, in those uh, countries. Um, Daniela, back to you. Thank you, Tina. Um, I will uh, have a follow-up question later for you and Siegfried regarding uh, this. May, may I just compliment Daniela? Yes, just sure, Siegfried, please go ahead. Uh, two, two, two. Maybe, maybe, maybe two remarks. Well, the, the first one on the, the, the difference of, of legal systems. I, I truly believe that we, we have to, to implement the Bologna tools clearly. Yeah? And, and now we have a proof of concept with the proof of concept that they are needed really uh, because we have the, this uh, huge need for transnational cooperation with the, with, the, with the ALMs. But what I want to, to point out is that I'm, I'm a true European, but Europe is not always the only solution. So. It's, it's great to have uh, common frameworks and common tools, but we also need to think about bilateral dialogues. And this is why we have a strategic dialogue today is also important huh? because we can try to dis decipher, uh, uh, try to, to solve things that are linked to the national, the, the difference between two national systems. And I mean, alliances are, are, are actually a bundle of bilateral uh, bilateral um, cooperations. So this is the first remark. The second remark is on the, regarding the funding. Well, um, I, I, I coming back to what, what, what we said just, just before, I mean, the question of sustainability is linked to where the alliances want to go. Uh, you can think about several models. One model is an international organization. You have the Institute of Florence. Uh, this is purely public, and they try nowadays to have some uh, external external resources. But this is the true European University today. This is one one example. And then you can have a, a can a kind of a, a super lab for projects. And so uh, um, they say that partners want to, to share some things. But where is the sustainability need? Is it at the level of the alliance? Or do you need sustainability at the level of each partners? Because the islands can be sustainable, but the partners remain, you know, uh, the way the way they were before. So, I mean, it's really linked to, to the um, it's really linked to, to the model of the island. And so far, I have to say that uh, I have a closer look about uh, several alliances, but it's to me it's not really uh, clear enough now what the different sustainability models are. We are thinking about European funds putting them together, just as I said, and coordinate with the with the with national resources where, where, where they are. But of course it's also linked to the model of the different alliances. Thanks, Siegfried. If I understand uh, correctly what you are pointing out, one of the things you're pointing out is that the purpose of the alliance needs to be clear uh, to the alliance, to the partners, but also to the member states to identify the optimal routes to make the funding sust sustainable. And I completely share that with you. I think it's uh, one of the, the things the alliances are working on because in the first phase they have been building the activities, their added value for their partners. And in the next phase, they will sharpen this added value. And I think that this, the sustainability approach will follow. But that's where also the close dialogue with the member states, discussions like the ones we are having today will be uh, will continue to be essential, and I have really all the trust that uh, is getting intensified uh, already now and will be even more in the future. Peter, coming yeah. back to the remark from Adam on yeah. diversity, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, well, uh, well uh, on diversity, but first on on the uh, on the regulatory uh, ob obstacles is a declared objective, declared objective of the European University Initiative that through the cooperation in the alliances, the Commission and the Council and the Parliament can identify uh, obstacles and work on them. That's a declared objective of the European University Initiative. The Bologna tools are good, we should use them, but they are too soft. I think there's scope for using uh, non-discrimination articles in the treaty, for example, to promote open and transparent merit-based recruitment. And uh, the Commission, I believe DG EAC, has launched a consultation on the academic career. Very interesting. I call on all of you to contribute to this consultation and see what comes out in ideas, instruments, legal or non-legal, financial or others. Very important initiative. On the inclusion, the, the let's face it, Erasmus, Horizon, has made the rich richer. It's organized brain drain. 
the, the Marie Curies all wanted to go to the UK and Switzerland. And that's, that's the situation. Now with the UK is a bit different, although we miss them. Uh, I would say use the uh, European University alliances as a, soft, as a soft bridge, as an umbrella. And the Council of Ministers, 21st of May 2021, has called on the European University 19 points, remember, but one was consider joint enrollment of students and consider joint recruitment of staff. And several alliances are doing that. They are saying, we have the French rules, we have the Spanish and the Bulgarian rules, we keep them, and the salaries. But we create, for those people that we recruit, uh, an alliance professorship or an alliance director of library. And this person could get a little advantage here and there, and this person would be selected by an alliance selection committee following national rules, following national rules, but you have to pass the hurdle of the alliance. This will create much more open, transparent, and merit-based recruitment, and it costs nothing, but it creates an enormous status difference for these people, so go for it in the joint selection committees. I would recommend it to make it part of the cahier de charge, because let's face it, we call it the call for proposal, and the commission always says, pick and choose, as long as you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you can't do an alliance without a campus. You can't do an alliance without a challenge team. You can't do an alliance without student-based teaching. Standard, yeah. So I would say you can't do an alliance without joint nomination of senior staff. Something for the next round. Thanks, Peter. You stole my follow-up question mm -hmm. because it was exactly on this. So the alliances are an opportunity if universities, with the support of the member states, organize also staff that is distributed to make it more diverse and to have the needs, the local context of all countries better represented. Uh, I think this is a very interesting point and I'm very curious to see how this will be developing further in the second phase because I'm sure that these discussions are taking place across all the alliances. We um, have to very soon wrap up. I'm looking at Honi, who has to make uh, the closing statement. Could I take one very last question? Uh, and then the colleague that will ask and the, the panelist that will answer, please be very brief because Honi has uh, to leave, but was a colleague in the back. If he could have a mic. No, no, I'm going to be brief. Uh, hi, my name is Marco and I'm from Croatia. And I have one youth-focused question for the only young person in a panel. And I'm glad that we're going to end with this. So basically, um, lots of research in the youth field basically are saying that young people of today are much less uh, concerned about university rankings, pr rankings, prestige, and so on and so forth. But they are much more interested in, you know, university carbon print, sustainability, the colonization issues, and so on and so forth. So my question for you would be, do you think that European universities, alliances that we have, respond to these, you know, new things that are happening in the youth field? And if yes, how? Thanks. Very interesting question, but really complicated to answer <laughs> really shortly, but. This is a very important question, yeah. and I am really happy that you asked Tangi. So. Yeah. Okay, I will still try to be brief. Reasonable uh, reasonably brief, please. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I completely agree um, on, on, on what you said. Um, first of all, the ranking system actually, I mean, I know no students, um, in, and I met a lot of them across Europe, who care about rankings. The only person who care about rankings are the people uh, in the um, cabinet of rectors. They are the only persons. And why do they care about the rankings? Because it's, um, it's create condition to receive fundings from the governments, which is how the system works. Is it a good way to how the system works? Personally, I don't think so. Because actually, it makes the university working for who? Not the students, for the people in the cabinet who are, who are th only thinking about budgets. Which is, I mean, we need budget to live. Obviously, we need. But why university exists? Are they exist for the people in the cabinet or for students? Personally, I believe that the university, and when I say university, I think uh, I, uh, I education institutions in a whole, I think that exists for the students because we are the main stakeholders 
in the in the uh, HCIs, we are the main person who are here. And I mean, imagine a university without students. What it is? Nothing. Emptiness. So, uh, higher education institution should exist for the students. And if we want higher education institution exist for students, then we need to think what the students want. And indeed, students want to have uh, an higher education institution. We think about the carbon footprint. We think about have a decolonizing decolonize a view on uh, on the teaching and s all the things that you list it's the things that actually the students care about so if the universities and the governments want to keep the rankings i mean it will be a complicated task to erase them unfortunately but please at least consider this and i will add one thing to your list is how the university can help the students in precarious situation because actually when you have uh, students who struggle to pay the rent who struggle to pay, to pay their meal obviously we can't be focused during the classes we can't s sometimes even attend the classes because we have to work if we want to survive some of them have to uh, abandon higher education and it's terrible because probably the students would have been amazing person, amazing researchers, amazing politics, amazing person who may have changed the world. But we will never know because they had to stop because they had financial issues. And actually, there are too many uh, students who are not able to afford themselves the basic needs. So I will. Uh, I I try to be brief, but not that brief. Thank you, Tangi. I think your statement deserves a high end, and I. Please. This is why we are here. And also as staff, I think I can speak for many colleagues. You know, we are not getting rich working for university, not financially, but intellectually and spiritually, ethically. We are among the, mo the richest people in the world. And when you said about students abandoning work, I am the daughter of a poor guy who could not finish university because he had to work. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So we need to continue working, thinking of the purpose that university has always had and the one that still nowadays has. And things are not easy because of frameworks, but are possible. I think the, the panelists today, all the speakers we have had, the colleagues in the room, uh, when I say colleagues, I mean students and staff, are the living proof that there is the competences, the willingness, the enthusiasm to get there. So uh, let's continue on this journey together. And I would like to again thank all the speakers, all the panelists for their contributions today and for inspiring us. And I'll give the word to Honey uh, for the closing words. If you want, of course. Yeah, it still works. I'll get you some glass nice of water, nice Gwani. <laughs> so, Gwani, you. you're the director of Studio Europa Maastricht. I am. Uh, you also had the pleasure, I think, of hosting this event among different organizations, and I think it's very nice that you'll be doing the closing Thank words. But Thank you very much, and I'll just fill in with uh, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a really a great pleasure for me to give the closing words. Uh, the strategic dialogue on European universities is coming to an end. And maybe I could also say the passionate dialogue on European universities, because that's what I'm taking home, especially from this panel, uh, group of panelists, but during the day and speaking to several of you as well. I also realize that I'm the person standing between you and a well-deserved drink. So I, and this morning I noticed I didn't put on one watch, but two watches by accident. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm confident that I can keep it short and sweet. So my name is Connie Willems. I have the pleasure of leading Studio Europa Maastricht one of the co-organizers of today's event. And uh, we work together, we're located within the university and we work together on an equal partnership basis with the province of Limburg and the city of Maastricht on bettering the European profile of the region, the city and the university. Uh, our team is mainly responsible for the interdisciplinary research agenda of the UM on Europe. And all six faculties of the university participate in uh, this research agenda, uh, because we strongly believe in finding new solutions for the challenges of Europe within the cutting edge of disciplines and 
uh, in that sense, interfacultary collaboration. So it's, I think, nice to mention also that that's one of the responsibilities of SEM. And the other one is strongly rooted within what was called today also this third mission of a university, and that is bringing society and science closer together. And I'm sure that all of you have a strong idea about what that entails. Um, for us, this is also about organizing a lot of uh, societal events. Uh, and I would like to give uh, take just a, sh a short opportunity to share with you some of the things that we did. So of the many events, last year we had the pleasure of welcoming 200 European citizens in Maastricht for a pan-European dialogue, the Conference on the Future of Europe. I'm sure that many of you heard of that as well. It was in this location as well. Then we had a bigger hall with two and a half meters distance between all of the participants, but we managed to pull it off to facilitate such a very strong citizen-driven dialogue uh, within this framework of the European Conference uh, that was organized by the Commission and the Parliament. Um, last year, we also commemorated the Maastricht Treaty 30th anniversary, and we did 30, 40 events. And we also collaborated with the Institut Francais uh, several times because it was not only the 30th uh, anniversary of the Maastricht Treaty, but also, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the France presidency of the European Council. Uh, today, we continue that collaboration, so I would definitely want to thank the uh, uh, Institut Francais for this great opportunity also to collaborate again, and I'm hopeful that we will continue in the future as well. A big thanks, of course, to the Ambassador um, and of France, uh, to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, that he was here today for uh, addressing us, so that's a great pleasure as well. One last thing as an example, next year we will organize in Maastricht the I think the largest European election debate uh, in the eve before the European election. So we're expecting around 2,000 European youngsters, first time voters to people in their 20s in Maastricht, on the square of Maastricht, but also inside the theater. And we are expecting more than 300,000 viewers online as well. So that is something that the team of Studio Europa and the partners look forward to in organizing. Um, let's see. So I'm proud to say that at UM, we take this third mission very seriously. We strongly invest in uh, European collaboration and European values, and I think uh, Youth for UM is a great example of that, as is SEM, Studio Europa Maastricht, and, and we are very much com complementary in that mission. Uh, so it was a great pleasure also working together with the colleagues from uh, Youth. Um, I think for us it's very important to be that European university but also be strongly rooted in the region. And I loved also the panel on this regional embeddedness of universities and especially in our role to keep uh, economies healthy and society healthy as well for the challenges of the future. So big thanks also to the colleagues from the university and the youth colleagues that were here today. I am an outsider from the European University Alliance, because of course I, I have sort of an outside in perspective. I know the great work that has been done by my colleagues. I met several of you today as well, and I have to see I have, I have really great respect for what you guys are doing, uh, working towards and also working within the context of Euro European universities. Whether or not you're new to this or whether or not you're working already since the first generation of the European alliances, uh, for me, it's almost an impossible task, right? You have to be a, a rock star in diplomacy. Uh, you have to not just uh, get a grip on the governance structure of just one organization, but of 10 organization, uh, and also take care of each other's targets, goals, wishes, and culture. So that uh, is one of the things you have to do. Another is, for example, to be a networking superstar amongst the alliances, but also with all the partners that you collaborate with uh, for example, in these regional ecosystems, while keeping a look outside the door, because there's where the new opportunities lie. Uh, so I really respect that, and maybe you could even say that you guys have to be clairvoyant, because you have to anticipate or, or focus on the needs of staff and students that we currently have, but also anticipate on what is coming, what developments are coming, what challenges Europe and, and higher education is facing. So, big respect for that. I think we can all agree that this list goes on and on and on. I hope today's session gave you a lot of inspiration also and a lot of connections between each other to keep learning and keep going and keeping your eye on the prize. And that's the actual purpose of the European University Alliances and educating students in the framework of 
European values. So, good luck. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I on the price. Okay, I think I'm at my closing. So closing off first also, and I'm not naming everyone by name, but thanking all of the excellent facilitators, also the inspirational speakers that we had online, also on the panel today. It was really a great pleasure to learn from you all and also hear a passionate address uh, from several of you guys. Uh, big uh, it's also nice to thank my team because of course I'm very proud of what they accomplished today. Uh, Annelies van Rijen in the back. <laughs> of course I name all of them, but uh, this gives me also a chance to put some sunshine specifically on, uh, on some that work very hard on this program. Annelies van Rijen, Job Zomerplaag today moderating, also Daniela, thank you very much for moderating. And uh, I would like to invite you to welcome uh, or to join me for a drink. And finally, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I invite you to keep in touch with us, right? Uh, while working on the university alliances, uh, we hope that we made a connection today also to keep learning together and growing in these ambitions that we all share. Thank you very much. Before you leave, I actually wanted to, I, I was, everyone is talking about 2017 as a date, and maybe for some of you it's familiar, but it was Macron who introduced the idea of the European universities. Let's go back to that speech, because I looked it up, it was a famous Sorbonne speech, and he said something which is very applicable to what we have been doing today. He actually talked about how European universities are the acts of conquest for future generations, and I think we have been talking about putting young people at the center also of everything that you are doing. But he also mentioned that when governments lock horns, when policies change, there will be w women and men who will continue these histories and futures onwards. And I think that's what we've been discussing today, also how we can bring it on to the next generation. So today was about you, but it was also about people like Lea, it was about people like Tanguy. And I think it's very important that we also con consider this and that we also take that home. And we're very happy that we could do that as at the young university as Maastricht, together with other young universities across Europe that are part of the youth alliances and also the more traditional universities that were present today. I wish you very well back home, you know. <laughs> you, m some of you have to travel over six hours, I learned this morning. Some need, need to go by bike. But uh, except for that, I hope to welcome you back, either in Maastricht or elsewhere, our path will meet again, hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you.